The following is a conversation with Ben Askren, wrestler, MMA fighter, and a brilliant, opinionated, and fun personality in the world of martial arts. And yes, he occasionally likes to talk a little trash. Given his wild online antics and his boxing match with Jake Paul, some people may forget just how dominant he was in the sport of wrestling and in MMA for most of his career. In wrestling, he is a two-time NCAA Division I national champion and four-time finalist. In mixed martial arts, he went undefeated for 10 years with a record of 19-0 before losing to Jorge Masvidal with a flying knee that caught everyone by surprise. He's also into cryptocurrency, disc golf, and is the co-host of Flow Wrestling Radio Live. This is a Lex Friedman podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, here's my conversation with Ben Askren. Before we talk about your incredible wrestling career, your MMA career, let me ask you, I have to ask you, what did you think about the Jake Paul versus Tyron Woodley fight? Uh, well, I thought, I mean, I'm obviously biased. I thought Tyron won. Um, I had five rounds of three. And again, this, maybe this is my bias in the way I was seeing it. I thought he was more effective with the striking and he was more aggressive. No, Jake had more volume. Um, but that was the only like thing I would give him. And I guess a lot of people just didn't see it that way. They thought he landed more significantly more punches. I just didn't think he really did any damage. It was a split decision. Split decision. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised? Um, well, there's the thing. So the thing I said when I went in to fight him, I said, we don't really, maybe he's good. Maybe he's not. We have no, we really have no idea to this point, you know? And so I knew Tyron was a lot better at boxing than I was. And so I thought, okay, Tyron's, there's, I think there's a good likelihood that Tyron beats him up. Um, but there's a chance that Jake's kind of good at this. And I think that's kind of what played out is He's kind of good at it. Even if you saw it the way I saw it, he still was impressive in his showing. And he's obviously put a lot of time into it. So he's he's not bad. <laughs> we'll say that much, you know. But isn't it surprising to you that like a uh, elite level athlete, combat athlete, mm -hmm. lost to somebody who just takes it really seriously, but is nevertheless not elite level? Um, hmm. But, but I think boxing is a really specific rule set. Uh, so I'll speak about Tyron, not myself. Tyron had, had good striking, but the, obviously w it was his first boxing match ever. Um, and within mixed martial arts, you have the the fear of the takedown and the fear of the kick and fear of other things to go along with the punching. And so if you look at Tyron throughout his MMA career, lots of times what set up his punches were like level change fakes at a takedown. They dropped, boom, and then something comes over the top, right? Mm -hmm. So there's many more elements to worry about in mixed martial arts, whereas boxing, there's only one. It was his first fight. Yes, I thought Tyron was going to win. I thought this was going to happen. But like I said, I mean, it's pretty evident that Jake's, he's not bad at boxing. He's pretty solid, you know? He gets in there and works hard at it, I guess. Out of 10 times, how many times do you think Jake wins? I guess Tyron? I guess Tyron. Hmm. They fight again and again and again, like iteratively. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I part of the thing is, okay, so Jake's corner said you need a knockout going into the eighth round, right? So I think they thought maybe they're trying to motivate him, but I, I don't see it that way because if they if they were actually thought that he was winning, why would they encourage him to take a dumb risk when Tyron has clearly his knockout power, right? It's a really stupid coaching philosophy if that's what you're thinking. So you obviously are thinking, hey, this is actually in the balance. It's competitive. Um, and I feel like Tyron thought maybe he was winning and didn't have the urgency necessary. And so I think if he, he, there's a chance he turns it up a lot. Hmm. Man, I would want to watch him again before I... I, I so, see, okay, I, want, I have this problem second. with my personality. Here's my personality, Lex. Um, I have an issue with not being able to give really exact answers. So I hate giving you an answer that, like, I don't feel like is 100% calculated. Yeah. So... Um, I would like to see them go once more because I would like to see, hey, can Tyron, if because if, if Tyron can turn up the pace and, and Jake can't handle it, then I think it's an 8-1 or 9-2, right? Um, if it goes the exact same way and maybe Tyron wins a close split decision, I'm saying, oh, well, that's, it's probably going to be close every single time. We're probably going to get a 5-5 five to five type of thing, you know? So it's like, I feel like out of one match, it's not totally indicative of what the future is going to look like. I feel like Tyron would get a knockout and then you would still be in the same place like not <laughs> not knowing possible, possible. not knowing what to predict. Yeah. Okay, so your fight mm -hmm. with Jake Paul, 
Yeah. Looking back, you have a, had a little bit of time now. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you analyze that fight? Uh, well, I mean, the, the fight specifically, I got cracked with an overhand right, so I mean, it kind of sucks. Um, I would say, you know, and this is where everyone's like, I, I don't, I really don't care. Um, and everyone's like, why would you do that? Make it tarnish your reputation. It's like, well, I, wa I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. I had an enjoyable time training and in the build up. Obviously, I wasn't skillful enough to to get the win. But if I even even despite the fact that I know it's going to happen, what happened? If someone asked me to do it again, I probably would have done it again, you mm -hmm. know. And so the way I was thinking about when I was deciding whether to do it or not, because I got the offer, it's like, okay, is this money? It can change my life. Yeah, it could. Right? It's not going to double my net worth, but it's it's going to add significantly, and make my life easier. And number two is like when I was in high school, we used to do boxing matches for free just because we thought it was fun. We didn't have a, something going on Friday night. Me and my buddies would get together and we had some boxing goes in my basement and we'd punch each other in the head. Mm -hmm. So it's like for something I think is enjoyable and not going to pay me a whole bunch of money, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Would you, do you think if you got the rematch, if you did the rematch, would you, what are the odds you win? Okay, let's I'm not, say. Probably not very good. I think he's pretty good actually and I'm not very good. And that was probably <laughs> at, a, at a low point for me because, I, so when I started training for that, I was like 215 pounds, which is the heaviest I've ever been. I yeah. came off my hip surgery. I literally... Like when I said, yes, like I'll do it. Like I had literally started working out like the week before for the first time in my, you know, it, it, since the surgery, cause I wasn't able to do anything. So could I, could I perform better? Yeah. But now after watching him box Tyron, like if you ask me, Ben, can you beat Tyron? Mm, prob probably not. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I can beat Tyron. So in boxing, in, bo in, boxing, correct, yeah. in boxing, yeah. So my chances of beating him, you know, and, and <laughs> watching that card, it's like, damn, like, kind of be fun to box someone who I know sucks, who I know can beat. That, that's what would be fun, you know? Because, like, the training, the pre preparation was fun. But then, obviously, I got, I got my butt kicked. That that sucked. You know, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, of course. Okay, well, I was going to drop an F-bomb, but I wasn't quite sure. So okay. I, <laughs> I think that sucked is a swear. No, no, no. You, you, could, you could drop all, okay. all of the F-bombs you want. So, preparation-wise, do you think you were more prepared for that fight or the, the Jordan Burroughs exhibition? Uh, hmm. I mean, like, the, how did you approach Burroughs. it mentally, you know? Um, well, the Burroughs thing, I, I obviously, so, okay. So when I retired the first time in 2017, Burroughs was the only current, like, we'll say really elite level wrestler that I'd never trained with. Um, I was really good friends with the Nebraska head assistant coach, still am. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, I just want, I'm going to pay my own way. I want to come down and train with Jordan because I want to see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna, I want to get in there and mix it up. I mix it up with David Taylor and Kyle Dake. I mean, there's just something about wrestling that I love. And so I flew myself down there in January of 2018, and I spent four days training with Jordan. It was a really good time. It gave me some great insight into how he thinks and, you know, what a great champion he is. What was it like training with him? Like, what, it can you so give fun. some insights? Yeah, like, of course. Like, what the, like, how hard is the the live training? Is it more yeah. drilling? Is it technical? Like, how does his it seems like his style is very different than yours. So yeah. how does that match up in the room in terms of like what you learn from each other, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. We only went full live for one, I think it was like a 12 or 15 minute go where it was just go wrestle. Mm -hmm. um, we did a bunch of simulated live, but obviously he, he had, so I was a senior in college when he was a freshman in Nebraska. And so we, our teams had dueled each other. He was obviously a lot smaller at that point in time. Um, but he had, he had followed my career. And so when I went in there, it was like, hey, I know you're really good at this position. What about this position? What are you trying to do? How exactly does it work? And then let's wrestle there, <laughs> you know? And then, hey, what about this position? And so, you know, we would spend 30 to 40 minutes talking about that position. On the and ground or? I, it was like, uh, one was a chest wrap, one was a headlock, one was, uh, I don't even remember, it's called, the, we call it the lightning dump, but it's a. You the lightning both. dome? Yeah, I was, I named, my buddy's <laughs> name was Lightning Luke Smith in high school, and he was the first person I saw do it. So Got usually it. when I see someone do something, then I name that move after them. Got it. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Great name. It's a good so, name. So, uh, yeah. But so what I said with that is like, okay, he was still trying to be the best in the world. I was just trying to go work out with Jordan Burroughs because I enjoy wrestling. Yeah. Um, is like someone who at that point, what he has five world titles at that, four or five at that point, a, a lot. And so I use it with my high school kids. It's like, hey, this, this is a guy who's the best in the world who's bringing someone in and saying, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? What about this? What about that? And so the level of inquisitiveness, that's a hard word, inquisitiveness he has 
is really impressive. And then it's obvious why he got to the level he did because he's figuring out all these little situations. And that's honestly one of the biggest things I think wrestlers, a lot of wrestlers fail to do as they get older. Even when they get to early college age, they say, this is my style. This is what I do. I'm going to lift and work out hard. And I'm and I'm not going to add anything to my game. You know, whereas you've seen many progressions in Jordan Burrow's game. He just made his 10th world team. And you, yeah, and I, you know, if you have a really keen eye, you've been able to watch him change. You know, so I've been watching him since 2007. He's changed so much and obviously still maintained a, a world class level almost the entire time. When you say change, like what changed? Because he's, he's got that double leg. Yeah. But there's not good double leg anymore. What's that? He like hit his double leg for the first time against Alex Deirdre. He hadn't hit it in years. Hmm. Yeah. So that's like when people think about Jordan Bros, they think about the double leg because yeah. in his early years, Fire, he had a great double leg, right? And even in the, so, in those years, I would say the the biggest thing with Jordan Bro's double leg wasn't his level of explosiveness; it was his level of persistence. Mm -hmm. He would shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, yeah. and it would a lot of times would be from fun, creative angles and out of scrambles. Boom! All of a sudden, he's on yeah. you, you know. And it was just he was just super persistent with it, and I think that was probably the key. And then you saw, you know, when he came out to the one of the first world championships in 2011, it was kind of that type of mentality and then shortly after then obviously everyone was starting to lower their stance getting lower and he developed a really good like mantis go behind series where he would go one way the other way then he started developing a really good like low single ankle pick type thing you know and then his hand his hand fighting got really tremendous like 15 16 17 his hand fighting was really good and now i just commented at the 21 trials like a few of the defensive sequences he got into, it's like, holy shit. Like, just not from an athletic standpoint, but from a technical standpoint, the things he were doing was just tremendous. So I've seen him as someone, like, who's continued to reinvent themselves over the course of the last 10, 12 years. Especially in the, as a junior and senior mm -hmm. in college, you were exceptionally dominant. Yeah. If you were to face him at the peak, both of your peaks of NCAA yeah. wrestling, could you, uh, could you beat him? And if you can beat him, well, of course you can beat him. Yeah. Uh, how do you solve the Jordan Barrows puzzle? Well, uh, so from a folk style wrestling standpoint. Folk style, yes. Folk style. So, you know, he, he had some competitive matches his junior and senior year. He had a 2-1 win over, uh, or maybe it's 3-2, over Michael Chandler, who was my teammate, who's fighting UFC now. He had a 2-1 win over Tyler Caldwell. Um, so I think you can glean some insight into that. You know, he got ridden. He got so mad about this up on a podcast. So during Corona, we had to make up all kinds of bullshit to talk about. Yeah. And we were doing like the last 10 years, best 165s. Mm -hmm. And I said, Kyle Dake would ride him for over a minute. Oh, wow. <laughs> he got so mad he wanted to come on the podcast the next day. So hopefully he doesn't listen to this. Be like, <laughs> fuck you, man. You know? Um, but, you know. What, I, what, when was this? This is during Corona. Corona, last year. He got mad. We were talking about. we were Before the trials. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, um uh, you wow. know, Michael Chandler wrote him for two minutes plus, and that was his junior year, not his senior year. Sure, right, but it, it, it's close. Um, so I think there's some things there. I think the interesting thing would be if if I would have stuck around, right, so I chose to go into mixed martial arts after 2008, mm -hmm. I would have been 74 and he would have been 74, so we would have had to wrestle. And then I think that the freestyle Jordan Burroughs puzzle is a lot more difficult to solve than the folk style Jordan Burroughs puzzle. And I think, I don't think he would, I think he would acknowledge that He's much better at freestyle than he was at folk style. Uh, you know, although he was very good, he's better. Does his like raw speed explosiveness um, present he, a problem to you? Well, so he was never. I mean, he he didn't ex really excel on the mat in kind of either style. In freestyle, he has got some good lace transitions, but in folk style, like his whole like in his entire college career, I think he has like ten pins, mm -hmm. which is almost nothing. You know, so he was get, gaining no value off the top position. He was good enough on most people to get off bottom without it being an issue, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, this is an area where we really have to be careful. There's a lot of things here. You know, it's just, it, he wasn't gaining value there. Whereas in, in freestyle, he, I don't want to say never, but the amount of times he gets turned is incredibly rare, very, very rare. Um, and he does have like lace transitions, so he gets a lot of points there. So, and obviously freestyle is, it can be geared way more in the neutral position, right? Where we're only doing takedowns, so... Yeah. Were you surprised that he lost to Dake in the trials to Kyle Dake? Oh, Kyle's so so he's so good, right? I mean, I think I think his performance in the Olympics was uh was his loss in the Olympics was, was shocking to I mean we never seen that happen to Kyle Dake. You know, he's been a guy who's competed with Jordan Burroughs forever and obviously he was on the losing side for a while and now he's on the winning side. Um 
But I think a lot of people thought it was a coin flip. And I think actually Kyle Dake made it feel like it's not a coin flip. It feel, it, right. Now, to me, it feels like Kyle Dake is going to win that match significantly more times than he isn't, is what it feels like. Yeah. I forgot which trials it was. Was it four years ago where Kyle Dake threw him? Like he, he, so you, was, you saw inklings of like, yeah. oh, wow, there might be a, eventually a changing of the guard. Yeah. So 13, Kyle came out and he had the one throw, but then he lost one of the matches decisively. Um, and then he was hurt in 14. And in 16, Kyle Dig actually went up to 86 kilograms. So in, in actually in 16, at the trials we had, um, so Jake Herbert was number one seed. He was former, uh, as Guy Russell, I was a former world silver medalist. So you had uh, David Taylor, who had not made a team yet, who is now a world champion, Olympic champion. You had Kyle Dake in the bracket, who was a two-time world champion now. And you had Jaden Cox in the bracket, who had not made any teams yet, mm -hmm. but is now, what, a four-time world medalist, two-time world champion. So, and then obviously Jaden came out on top of that, won his first Olympic medal, Olympic bronze medal. Um, so Kyle didn't wrestle Jordan in 16. And, and, Jordan, and Kyle's contention the whole time and they argued about this. So I actually did a little bit of backstabbing. Well, it was not, it's not backstabbing. And both backstabbing. of them were just one of I didn't tell any of them. Okay. okay. So Jordan got mad. We, so we, talk, we talked about this fake match during Corona, right? We, yeah. We had, to make, we had to make up something to talk about. Yeah. Because there's course. obviously no matches. So we talk about this fake match. And uh, uh, Do you stand behind that statement, by the way? Listen, here's, here's what I said. Kyle, Dick, Kyle Dick's four-time NCAA champion. Yes. I said, you got to pick, pick a winner. I said, Kyle Dick wins 2-1 on a minute and six ride time, yeah. which, I mean, is literally, we're talking... Yeah. As close as it gets, mm -hmm. as close as it gets for Kyle Dick, who's a four-time NCAA champion. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, were we talking over Folk Jordan Burroughs? Over Jordan Burroughs yes, in a folk style match. In a folk style match, the hypothetical, in college or now? hypothetical. Now or in college? In college, in college. both of them at their peaks at 165 pounds. Right. So completely <laughs> hypothetical. And so Jordan called in. He was all pissed yeah. at me for picking Kyle Dick. Yeah. He wants to come on the next day and argue his point. Yeah. So I said. F that. That's that's dumb. We had to pick a winner. We had to do something hypothetical. Yeah. So then I called Kyle Dake and I said, hey, Kyle, Jordan's going to come on and argue his case in the morning. If he's going to do that, why don't you come on and argue your case? Mm -hmm. So no one else knew Kyle was <laughs> coming on the podcast. <laughs> so they both show up and they went at it. But one of the contentions Kyle had for years, and there's still this rule, if you win a world level medal, the following year, you sit out until the very end of the American trials. And they do yeah. they do a best two or three. So every time previously that Kyle had wrestled Jordan, he had to come through a tournament on Saturday. Yeah. Okay. Probably three matches, and then on Sunday he would wrestle Jordan in a best two out of three. Mm -hmm. Right. So his contention was, I'm only wrestling Jordan at a disadvantage because I have to compete on Saturday, and then competing on which it, it's a fair argument. It really is. But I also see USA Wrestling's point is like if someone wins a world medal, we're we're going to reward them because we want that person on the team again so it's crazy though that you're like kyle dake had to wrestle because he's not wrestling bums in that not division. Bums, yeah and mm -hmm. and and it, yeah i don't know i don't know how wrestlers do it because yeah it, you have to go to war like three matches and then face jordan Barrows. yeah especially a few of those years with you know dake had uh, the name andrew howe but it, mm -hmm. those were really competitive oh, yeah. matches David Taylor had really competitive matches with him. Isaiah Martinez even got in there at Deeringer. So he had some really competitive matches before he ever got to uh, Jordan Burroughs. So I never answered your initial question was, uh, how did I feel? So the Jordan Burroughs match, I was not in wrestling shape at all, meaning wrestling's heavily dependent, especially neutral positions, heavily dependent on timing and other things. I was wrestling very, very minimally because I was I was started fighting again. Mm -hmm. So like my, my sh athletic shape was great, but it was mainly for fighting. I wasn't mm -hmm. wrestling. So um, I think they were actually trying to do Burroughs Dake at the Beat the Streets. It's mm -hmm. a big, it's it's the biggest fundraiser in wrestling every single year in New York. In New York City, yeah. they usually raise like a million dollars. They started all these programs in New York City to get which that I really wonder what they're doing with the money now because they probably can't get, have the kids wrestling because New York's crazy. Anyway, I, I think New York figures out a way what to do with the money. Hence, Michael Malice complaining that yeah. they're corrupt and all well, that. No, it go, it, but it goes to the Beat the Streets organization, oh, it does. who okay. then starts the clubs in New York. So I don't know what to do with the money. Anyway, so I was called like, I don't know, two two weeks before the event and said, hey, you know, someone was supposed to wrestle Jordan Burroughs. It fell out. Would you wrestle him? I said, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> you know, and it's like, listen, I, I, I trained with them for 
four days the year before, I had a pretty good idea how the match was going to go. It wasn't going to go so well for me. But it's like, okay, you're missing a main event. I can bring, a, because of where I'm at right now in my life, I can bring a lot of attention to wrestling. I can help you guys raise, yeah. raise a bunch of money for Beat the Streets. My my goal is, I think, I thought I could get one takedown or turn on him was kind of my goal for the match. I didn't get there. Uh, he went kind of hard. He went hard. Yeah, the asshole like, wouldn't give me a point. Yeah, the, that. <laughs> I said, this is bullshit, Jordan. I told him during the match, like, this is bullshit. <laughs> You're fucking going too hard right now. Yeah, I'm not a wrestler. I'm not a wrestler anymore. I'm a fighter. I'm coming in yeah. here. So yeah, so I, I had a really good idea. I mean, we we wrestled together. I think in, 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 in he'll probably get mad because I, I think in the live go we did like the 12 or 15 minutes. I think I actually scored a takedown in that. Yeah. I believe maybe or maybe it was a turn. He'll probably say no, I didn't, but whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I I knew what was going to happen. I I knew what the outcome was going to be. I knew I could probably I was hoping I could stay competitive and maybe you know lose like 10 two or something like, yeah. Well, let's walk back because I think uh, I originally brought it up in terms of how prepared were you against uh, Jake, Jake Paul, Paul yeah. versus uh, Jordan Barros. Yeah. So did you prepare for Jake cardio wise? Yeah, I, I worked hard. That's, yeah, I did. But it was I told I told you I started training for my. I mean, once once I had my hip surgery, yeah. they said uh, you know for the first six weeks you can't even walk, yeah. I, and it was hard for me to listen to him because by week four and a half, five, I was feeling pretty good. I want to get rid of my crutches, but I'm like, you know what? This is for the rest of my life. And if you get the, so if you get the real hip replacement, there's no wrestling, there's no nothing, mm -hmm. right? So that's the next step. So, okay, I'm going to take this serious. So I do my crutch for the six weeks. The next six weeks, it's still like really low weight bearing. Can't you know, do anything, you know? So then I get done with the three months, which is like January. And I'm like, okay, I should start working out. So I started riding a bike a little bit. And then, Okay, I'm now I'm, I'm fat. I'm fucking fat. I'm gonna get in better shape because I haven't been able to do anything. So I'm actually start working out, and uh, and then that happened, right? So I'm like, okay, well now I got three months, and it gives me a good reason to get back in shape. And um, you know, I, I knew I wasn't gonna do be a full time boxer, so it's like, okay, how do I put a boxing camp together? So I found, you know, I had I had my old teammate Mike Rhodes. He came up and kind of lived with me ish kind of thing for three months. Uh, I found a couple of this guy, K9 out of Michigan. He came over for three weeks. He was great. I went to Freddie Roach for a week. So I kind of like, you know, try to get as many good as ideas as I could. And my thought was like, okay, well, if this dude sucks, I can just be tough and, you know, block a few punches, get him tired, and then beat him up. If he's good, that's probably not much I'm going to do about it in the next three months because I'm, I'm, I was never good at boxing in the first place. All of my stand up in mixed martial arts was, predicated on how do I get through the two or three punches that are going to come at me in the time I need to get a hold of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only, you only have to make two or three of them miss and then boom, you're on top of them, at least for me. Um, that was all my striking was predicated on. It wasn't about, hey, I'm going to do damage on the feet in order to make something else happen. It was like, how do I clear this barrier, get a hold of you? And if you, I, I actually did the math one time. I think I got to take down, if you include the knockout round against Miles Vidal, I got to take down in every round except two. So it was like it was like fifty three out of fifty five rounds in MMA. I got to take down. Wow, somewhere somewhere in there. Okay, so you're hunting the takedown once you once right away w once you get, get uh your hands on them, you get yes. the takedown. Yeah. Okay, but the incredible thing about you, I I just uh, recently talked, uh, spent a couple of days with Jimmy Pedro, and uh, he talked about his guys and just champions in general hating to lose more than they love winning. Mm -hmm. And the way you talked about losing, you lost very few times in your career. Like yeah. later, you you were dominating both the wrestling and MMA. But the way you took these losses against people yeah. that are, I don't know, below elite level. It's fair. Uh, <laughs> I was also gonna get pissy, but, no, no, but I, it's sorry. completely fair. I thought he was a bum too. No, that's not what I meant. I hope not. I'm in trouble. It's okay. No, it's good. No, no, no. Um, uh, no, no. But like, what can you explain the psychology behind that? Like the what do, yeah. is is there a, a system behind this? Is there a philosophy behind this? Well, I so I I wasn't very good in the beginning, okay. and I think that, I think that's where it all starts from. So I didn't start getting good until the age of like 13. I started at five. I probably started competing more at age 10, 11. Didn't really get good till thirteen. It's still at thirteen. I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm great. I'm getting better, right? I'm mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, so I actually, I've actually, have, I have writing this book on sports psych, but this, it's I got, well, I got someone to write it for me, kind of thing. 
because uh, I've had this philosophy for years that there's there has to be this balance between two things, right? So on the one hand, in, the, in this category, on the one hand, you have hating to lose. A great champion has to hate to lose, like you said, right? Yeah. But on this other hand, you have to have someone who seeks out challenges, right? Because if you don't have that, you're never going to reach your full potential either. Mm -hmm. And so you have to balance these two balls at the same time, right? And so like for me, I always, and, and this is maybe because I wasn't good, but I was always like, let me go find the best people to wrestle all the time. Let me go find, I, I would like literally, uh, like seventh eighth grade when I was starting to get better, it was like, and this is on the internet, well, there's no one was using the internet. It was like a wrestling magazine. And be like, hey, dad, there's a tournament here. I think that other kid's going to be there. Can you take me two hours across the state today, please? Mm -hmm. sure. You would wrestle like in competition against them, not in competition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In competition. Hey, I heard there's this tournament. Here's the magazine. It says this tournament. Hey, dad, will you take me over there tomorrow? You, you weren't trying to win. You were trying to get the experience. I was trying to wrestle the best guys. Maybe I win, maybe I lose. There's no when you do a competition. There's no guarantee of a win or a loss. You're just doing competition, right? So I, I wanted to go. I wanted to challenge myself against the best guys, mm -hmm. of which I thought maybe I could come out on top, right? So like eighth grade year, I won way way. You know, I probably only lost a handful of to times in the state of Wisconsin. Well, the state of Wisconsin was probably really really minimal the amount of times I lost. You know, but it was just about getting the challenge. And it's like some some kids and not kids in my club, because I'll, I'll push them very hard on this, are scared of challenging themselves. They like being the big fish in the small pond. They're not willing to go say, I'm gonna, I wanna go get that guy, and I wanna get that guy, and I wanna get that guy. And so that's like, so I think that's part of it for me is like, I always just love the challenge. I enjoyed competing th thoroughly, right? And I understood from a young age, because it wasn't very good, losing's a part of it. You're not always gonna win. And that was kind of it. It's like, hey, sometimes, you know, and for my MMA career, I never, planned it to go that way but yeah i didn't lose for nine years and like that's that's pretty rare i didn't plan for that to happen that was just what happened okay know? but you also didn't lose like the second part of your college career my 87 i lost i won my last 87 matches yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that didn't come along with the hatred of losing you just i don't like losing i still don't like it yeah yeah I but, but you seem rather... to okay but you you don't uh you don't seem to, you you seem to kind of shrug it off a little bit Okay, so like with specifically with these two instances that you bring up with the Masvidal, I, it feels definitely so. Okay, hmm. all right, let's, let's go. Let's go deep. Let's go. Deep. So right, on the right. Masvidal one, it feels different because. Um, so had, wait, 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 wait. Let's for people who don't know. Okay. Uh, Masvidal loss was your first loss. First loss in, in MMA. MMA. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah, and I mean, and it was a dramatic loss. Very dramatic. And. There was this kind of buildup as you were potentially one of the greats yeah. of all yeah. time yeah. coming into this fight. Mm -hmm. And okay. so this pressure, all of that. So, the, no, I mean, I, I was thoroughly enjoying it. I, don't, I, <laughs> I didn't feel the pressure. Okay. So the Masvidal fight is, he, he got one fucking move on me. It's not like he beat me. And if we do that again, I think I win. At, at that point in my life, for sure, I think I win way, way, way more times than I lose. He he knew that too. That's why he didn't he didn't want to sound the sound the bottom agreement. That's why I had to taunt him and why he got so mad because I had to continue to taunt him in order to get him to sign right. Mm -hmm. um, so that one hurt because uh, and so people don't know my MMA career. I'll just go through it fast. I did three fights in like uh, smaller leagues. I got signed by Bellator. I was undefeated for three and a half years. I was nine and zero. Um, when I got done with that in twenty twelve, no, twenty thirteen. Um, I, at that point in my head, I was just going to transition to the UFC because that's where you go. I was ranked like six in the world. I hadn't really had a competitive match at the end of the Bellator thing. Mm -hmm. And Dana White, for a reason still unknown to me, we still haven't had this conversation. I wish I could ask him. I should ask him sometime. Um, chose to refuse me any entry into UFC. He just said, I went to his office and he literally said, we're not interested. We're not going to make you an offer. Did you did you mention something to uh, about him about the UFC? That was a year before that. That was okay. a year before that, okay. that, and that that might play a role in it. I think uh -huh. so. Uh, yes, what happened the year before that was uh, I called him a liar. Which, but listen, I'm right on this one because he said you can't test for drugs because I'm I'm all natural, which you could yes. tell by my physique, um, <laughs> and I was always put off by the fact that so many people cheated, and I I was very vocal about that. And so he had made some statement like, oh, well, there's no way you could test. I said, bullshit. You, you, very specifically, I said, USADA does it for all other sports worldwide. You can do it. And then it's funny because they hired USADA a couple of years later. Yeah. So I think he took some offense to that. But that was like a year and 
almost a year and a half, I think, somewhere yeah. it's later. Um, it's not like he holds a grudge or anything. <laughs> yeah. So I so I, I literally go to Vegas. Um, it's a long story. You can read about it other places. I, I So I got released from my belt. It's not like this is negotiating. I got released from my belt or contract. I said, I'm out of here. I'm going, I'm going to go to the UFC. I go to Vegas, and then I was told, hey, there's no offer for you. Tough shit, you know? So then I ended up signing with one championship. I spent, what, three and a half years there. I won the belt in my second fight and retained the title the entire time. And then I just, I Again, think, dominating people. Yeah, I, I didn't have a competitive fight. And so um, I retired 18 and 0. Never, never get, and for someone who loves a challenge, never getting to really challenge myself was incredibly frustrating. And I left the door open. I said, if I ever get the chance to prove him in this world, I'd love to come back. So somehow a year later, I get traded. Trades have never happened. And this is the one and only trade ever. I got, I've been retired for a year. I got traded. I get to come back. I fight Robbie Lawler the first fight. I win. And then essentially they're saying, okay, if you fight, uh, you know, if you beat George, you're going to get the title shot against Marty. And um, it's like, this is this is what I've been working for the entire, I've been trying to prove I was the best fighter in the world for the last 10 years. And I have, I've not been afforded this opportunity. Um, so when I lost to George, that was, that was hard because I, it was it's something that I had waited for, for a really, really long time. It was something that I, you know, I thought I could compete for and I never got the opportunity to do. So that one was hard. Um, at the same time, from like just a competitive logistic, it's like he got me with one move. It wasn't like he beat my ass for 15 minutes and I got beat a bunch of different ways. So that was like, fuck, like if I get it again, I could have done it, but I'm not, I'm not, they're not going to let me have it again. It's not like wrestling where you could go the next year or the next week or whatever, you know, you lose a big tens, you go to nationals two weeks later. Does so, that loss change you in any way? Your psychology? I don't, I don't think so. It's the no. first loss. I mean, had I, had I, had a longer MMA career post that, yeah, there definitely would have been a lot of time spent getting better at the en the entry point to the takedown, right? Which I'd already spent time there. Um, I don't, I, and I, I hate making excuses, but yeah, the, the hip, the hinging of my hip, what I couldn't do was preventing me from doing some things. And it's why if you look at the fight, I'm like bent over as I go for the double leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what happened for people who don't know, you went in for a double, double leg, leg and, and he went, flying knee. he did a flying knee yeah. and then and, and the way caught he, you well. Specifically the way he did that knee was kind of different than the way anyone had thrown flying knees before. Most people go more just from a stand straight vertical, whereas he took a few like running steps and went more, you know, the trajectory of mm -hmm. the angle was different. Um, so I think that's kind of probably why it caught, you know, the... I think a lot of things in combat, well, probably everything, but I focus specifically on combat, happens subconsciously. Like our brain is reading what's coming at us. And, and a lot of times it's stuff we've seen before so we can judge how to move correctly. Yeah, you misread because it's something you haven't seen had, before. Had not seen anyone come at that specific angle, yeah. So that loss was really hard. With the Burroughs one, I, I told you, I knew I was gonna lose. So it was like, yeah. f whatever, you know, I'm, a, I'm taking this because I want to put the sport of wrestling out there in a big way. I want to help them raise a lot of money. We sold at Madison Square Garden Hulu Theater and we raised a whole bunch of money. So my goals were accomplished. Mm -hmm. Jake Paul fight, I took it because they paid me all a bunch of money and I thought it was gonna be fun. Did I have any illusion I was a great boxer? No illusions whatsoever. Would I have preferred to win? Absolutely. But you know, like I told everyone, whether I win or lose on Saturday night, I'm gonna be back coaching wrestling on Monday because that's what I enjoy doing. And I was back coaching wrestling on Monday. And once in a while, these middle school kids give me a little bit of shit about it. And, that's it but that's wh it. where were you in terms of your shape and how you felt in the Masvidal fight would you say you're on the right. I mean it's a difficult question to ask of of a world class athlete but like were you past peak oh yeah yeah and so I don't know like, I don't know why guys like to lie about that I mean the peak for me was really evidently in my late 20s um, and maybe they are all fueled by extra supplements I, I don't know but i for me that that was evident but you get this so you get this crosshair where um you're if you're smart like a, you know like i mentioned john burroughs was you're still gaining wisdom you're gaining strategy you're gaining a lot of things right and so while your physicality may go down your overall skill level still may be rising especially in mma because people usually start later because they're gaining wisdom, strategy, all of the maybe more tools in their toolbox, right? They're getting all these things. So their actual competitive peak, despite their athletic peak going down, might still be a few years past that, right? Because these things are crossing. Um, no, so I felt I, I, was, I was great. Obviously, the hip was an issue. Um, 
it's, it's funny because so the I knew I had a lot of pain here and I knew it was because of this. And it was like, okay, whenever I'm done, I'll just get it taken care of, whatever. Uh, but I, every time I train, I would have pain kind of like all up my back. And the day after the surgery, I woke up and there was no pain on the right side of my, the surgery was on the left side. There's no pain on the right side of my back. I'm like, that's fucking weird. Like every, every morning I wake up, there's a lot of pain there, you know? Um, I'm like, okay, well, I'm on pain pills. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll come back tomorrow. And it's, it's really never, never been back. Since my oh, wow. So it was weird because it was like this. I thought this was affecting this, but it was affecting all the way across my whole back. So, you know, if I get to get a new hip, honestly, if I, if I, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to change the competitive outcome whatsoever. If I had known how good the hip replacement was going to be, I would have done it the second I retired from one championship in November of 2017. I would have had my hip surgery scheduled for December 1. Just from a lifestyle standpoint, I could only sleep in one position. I, there was a lot of things I couldn't do. I was in a lot of pain. Um, so I would have done that a lot earlier. But no, from an athletic point, it, I was ready to eat. This shit goes wrong sometimes. I don't know how to ask this, but you know, Joe Rogan, me, had a had a sense about you similar to like uh fedor mm -hmm. that you are potentially one of the greatest ever yeah does it hurt that you're not in the discussion now of being in the top 10 yeah um, of all time i didn't prove it i don't deserve it but you had a i mean but i what? didn't i didn't prove it i mean and so it's like um uh... Had I had I somehow gotten to convince Dana White, we go and convince him in 2013 to make me an offer, and I didn't even need a good offer. I just needed any offer. Had I gotten the offer then, maybe the outcome's different, right? But given, I would never expect anyone to think of me that way. I didn't prove it. I, I know I know what I was, and I'm good with that. And yeah, other people never got to see that. That's Do you think? Fine. Well, you don't know. You can't know fully, right? Do you think if you? Uh went to the ufc at that time instead of one championship i think i would have had a lot of success yeah i mean there's obviously certain guys there's a lot of guys i've trained with that i had a lot of really good results against and um who was the walter weight at that Ty tyron was a champion for a long time there so i was around tyron was a champion anthony was a champion at lightweight i was you know in the same gym as him and we had a lot of people coming through yeah I, would I, you face tyron would i have fought him i don't think so I mean, so he was still the champion when I came into the UFC, and we said, no, we we're not going to fight. All right. <laughs> hey, so he, he can't change history, right? So once something happens, you got to accept for what it is and move forward and, and obviously hope you can continue to keep accomplishing great things, which for me, obviously, my athletic career is over. So now it's going to be through my wrestling academies and, you know, who knows what else I get, get into. Oh, you might do exhibition matches and all that kind of stuff, right? Says who? wrestling and stuff no uh i don't think so so here's my thing with the wrestling matches is like just for fun if you said hey ben just for fun yeah would you love to go wrestle someone yeah i would i would right i love i love wrestling i get in there i love I, you know i love like so one of my guys has gotten to be pretty good he's in college he got him kicking on tool he just won a junior world title this year and so when when i'm doing private lessons i have such think about the development of the athlete sometimes i can wrestle hard but most of the time it's like I'm just going to help them with whatever they need help with. And it's still wrestling and it's fun, but it's helping them. You know, for like, for Keegan comes back this summer and he's training for the general title. So to be able to just shake hands sometimes and say like, I'm going to try to kick your ass. Should you try to kick my ass? Mm -hmm. You know, like just to go, like, yeah, it's a good it, feeling. It's so much fun. Yeah. And I don't get to do that very much. So if you said, Ben, would you love to do some matches? And the answer is, yeah. The problem, unfortunately for me, and maybe you can talk me off a ledge here is like because of where I've gotten to in my career, if I choose to do a wrestling match, it, it's gonna, people are gonna be really excited about it, it's gonna blow up and it's just like, I just wanna wrestle just to wrestle. I'd rather just like go in a room where no one can watch and just wrestle and just in, enjoy it. Well, you could also wrestle, so there's different kinds of wrestling. There's wrestling where there's an event mm -hmm. and like, you know, there's a build up and an announcement. Yeah. And you can also do like uh, Khabib style, like in the room, there's cameras and you're kind of going, it's like, like Khabib whoop. does that? No, in uh, Marcel did that. He whooped my ass a few times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've seen Khabib with some videos. Okay, it's not like set up. It's just people going hard, and then it's more fun. Yeah, you know, and it's it's also more like presenting the beauty of the sport. Yeah, you know, for sure. And and like and there's no winning or losing really. 
in yeah. that context. Yeah, yeah. Like you're just, you're always joking around a little bit, yeah. even when you go super hard. So I feel like, especially in the modern day with, with the internet, that's a compelling way yeah. to do. So I've thought about, this is the one thing I've <laughs> thought about doing. Cause uh, I told you about my buddy who has the, the content thing. It's called Rockfin. I thought about doing, you know, the old really famous Gracie challenge. Yeah. Okay. So I thought about doing the Askren challenge. You want to hear my rule set? Yeah. Let's go. I'm not sure I'm going to do this. People are going to show up to your, like in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, I have to select you. I'll start with a thousand bucks, right? All right. Okay. 30 minutes. You pin me or I pin you. That's it. No points, no nothing. Mm -hmm. We just wrestle. Camera, that's it, right? It's camera in the room. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a referee because we don't want there to be contention over the pin. So just one pin. Just one pin. So 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. If I pin you, you don't get shit. You go home, right? Every person I pin, it goes up by $1,000, 2000 3000 4000 5000 oh. and so on. If you make it the distance and I don't pin you and you don't pin me, I'll pay for your travel and give you 500 bucks, mm -hmm. right? Just a kind of consolation prize for showing up. If you pin me, you get whatever the jackpot is. <laughs> Wait, who's adding to the jackpot? I am. It's my, it's my, money. my but, money. But then what's the incentive to keep winning for you? Because the jackpot. Well, because I was, so I would put the content somewhere and people would watch it. Oh, right? so you're gonna so, make money. Yeah, okay. so you'd make money that. But way. it's not exponentially growing, right? It's just going up by like. Yeah, I really think there's probably only a couple of people that could pin me. So I would either just not choose those people or wait till I get a really large audience and people get really excited. In that case, I'm making a lot of money. So what, what do you think? How many matches would go with you? Like Kyle Dick shows up. I don't think he could pin me. Yeah, but I mean, like, so like Jordan Burroughs. Jordan Burroughs could beat me. But he can't pin me. He was never a pinner. Yeah. He ain't gonna pin me. There's only a few people who have the skill level to do so, right? It's, it takes a lot. Cause that was, so pinning was one of my specialties. I had yeah. the fourth most of all time and I won the pinning award the last two years. Um, so, so you think and then you can even be down on points and just pin them. This is actually one of the issues I have with jujitsu and the point system and the Eddie Bravo thing. I actually think the Eddie Bravo thing is kind of people get so mad at me. Sorry, jujitsu. I think it's bullshit. And you want me to tell you why it's bullshit? Yeah. So like if Jordan Burroughs whoops my ass and the score is 16 to two, but he can't pin me, then I get to go to overtime and get a cradle on him. I'm probably going to pin him. Mm -hmm. So I'm better than Jordan Burroughs. Nah, that ain't right. He just whooped my ass. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like if we can go the whole, cause they do submission only. Mm -hmm. So if Jordan Burroughs beats me up for what is it? Eight minutes, 10 minutes. I don't know. What's the length of an Eddie Bravo match? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's something, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we go 10, me and Jordan Bros go 10 minutes. He's going to outscore me significantly. But he, he will not pin me. I promise you that. Okay. So now we go, to, we go to the overtime. Strong words, but yeah. He won't. Jordan Bros is not going to. He's going to beat me. I will give you that. Kyle Dake won't pin you either. No. Okay. Okay. They will both beat me on points very badly. Now, David Taylor, he might, he might pin me because he's a very good pinner also. Um, they'll beat me very badly. They will not pin me. Um, but now we get to overtime and we get to pick like, uh, right? So in, in a Bravo, you get a rear naked choke or an arm bar. Okay, give me a cradle, I'll probably pin them. Okay, a good cradle. You can say cradle or maybe give them, they're not, probably not going to pin me, right? Maybe maybe there's a chance, but probably not because that's just not their specialty. Yeah, so for people who don't know, the Eddie, uh, Eddie Bravo thing is uh, when and it goes into overtime, you get a dominant position on a person yeah. and you get to, yeah, basically put them in a cradle. This is the wrestling equivalent. Yeah. But you uh, take their back. Or maybe amount. an arm bar. Yeah, like yeah. a wrestling arm bar. Yeah. So, and I don't think that's very fair because if someone whoops your ass, they whoop your ass. And then, you know, and so I think the reason why jujitsu people accept that rule set is that I don't think, I think they know this, but would admit it. I don't think their, their point scoring system adequately, adequately rewards what people value. So like right. in wrestling, we value takedowns because it gets us closer to the pin. And the, the most valuable scoring is a near fall near to the pin because mm -hmm. that's the ultimate goal of the sport. Whereas in jujitsu, for example, like if I were to get a takedown, uh, so like if I went to Gordon Ryan and he just didn't pull guard, I would probably get the takedown. Now, if somehow he didn't submit me, which he probably would, right? But say he got, got close to like 12 submissions, but somehow I slipped out of all of them. Mm -hmm. Now I win two zero, like that's ridiculous. Like he should very clearly win because he almost submitted. You know what I'm saying? Like there, and I and I realize the difficulty. I realize the difficulty in rewarding near submissions, but that is the most valuable thing is getting close to finishing the match. And in most competitions, they don't actually reward that. But okay, so this this isn't about the sport. This is about the Ben Askren challenge that we're talking about. <laughs> okay, what? Uh, why thirty minutes? Why not unlimited time? Hmm. Why why go until whenever? Well, because then it's just a cardio thing. Because at some point, um, 
then so, someone would just have to fall over dead, right? Okay. There's no more skill level involved. It's just who can, who can stand up the longest. You honestly don't think... <laughs> 30 minutes is a cardio thing, too. How do you think that's actually going to look? Kyle Day going against you for 30 minutes. What's so it's going to be kind of boring um, for the most part. Because, what position are you going to be stuck well, cause in? Well, because you, well, you can't, but you can't, you just can't have a gigantic amount of action for 30 minutes. So I, I related, because some of my kids, when, when I'm teaching them wrestling, they're like, well, but I can't do that for seven minutes. And I'm like, well, you know, like say, say if I had you do uh, hand cleans at a relatively heavy weight as hard as you could, you're not going to last seven minutes. Mm -hmm. You're going to, your pace will slow down, right? So my thing is like, well, your pace doesn't have to step here because in wrestling, you're competing against someone. Mm -hmm. So if you're here at 100 and you go to 80, but they go to 70, that's great. And then mm -hmm. you go to 60, but they go to 40, yeah. this is even better, right? Because the gap is growing. So we don't necessarily, if we get tired, that's fine. If they get more tired, that's better. So I think most people would know that. So they would kind of slow it down. Um, but yeah, I think in third, a third, I mean, I've, I've wrestled 30 minute goes, I've wrestled, six minutes, I've wrestled hour long goes, um, you're not going to get so tired. You're going to fall over in that time period. But at some point, if we, if it's unlimited, someone will get so tired that are dehydrated that they're just going to freaking fall over. Yeah. But you, you think, what about making it exciting and dynamic? You think the other person is always going to be going for the pin and thereby uh, make it dynamic. Well, if they were working that hard, then they might exhaust themselves, right. right? And and obviously, then if you're if you're being that dynamic, then you're adding risk to yourself too because you are, you know, doing that. Well, I love this. This is a great idea. <laughs> should, should do this. Well, I figure I'd get I rack up like twenty pins against bums, you know, or not not as great people in the beginning, and yeah. then I would start bringing in better people because they would be enticed by you know twenty thousand right. dollars, the possibility to win, and not not much fanfare, just a camera and just, just a camera. local. That's cool. it in my wrestling room. Yeah, yeah, Chief. like the Gracie Challenge. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And, may, and so then maybe you have like. Um, you know, for most people, you have someone edit like the 90 seconds of the most fun things that happen, and then you can watch the entire 30 minutes if you want to. Yeah. I mean, I think most people, if, if they're not really, really elite, um, I'm probably going to pin them. If yeah. they're not really elite. So, yeah. But I don't know. I, I That's something I've been thinking about that's just been like fun for me to think about. Um and obviously, it plays to my skill sets because my cardio is good and my pinning is good also. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, like you said, you weren't very good in your early days yes. until 13, 14. What was the switch? You became, you started to dominate people um, and in your college career. You dominated. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you, you stopped losing at some point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I would say, but, so even when I didn't lose in collegiate competition, I, I would go in the summers and try to make the world team. So I would lose some, not a lot, right? Minimally. Um, okay. So when I'm five, I start playing all sports. Like, I, I know you moved to America at what age? 13. Okay. So five. So in, in, at least I don't know what it was for you, but in America at my age, you usually played like a sport every season, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I did in the beginning. Um, I had minimal success in wrestling. I was kind of chunky. And then in fifth grade, I don't so I and I can't, I can't tell you, so I, I want to be better. And I told my parents, and this is funny because now I look at other 11 year olds and very few of them are this mature. And I actually think emotional maturity is kind of one of the key indicators of how long term successful someone's going to be. And at age 11, I said, I don't want to play baseball. And I like baseball, but I don't want to play baseball because I want to wrestle more because I want to get better at wrestling. So age 11, I quit baseball so I could wrestle in a club for March, April, and May because that was that was all that existed at that point in time. You couldn't wrestle in June, July, or August, any of those other months. Um, what was that desire to get better? What is it? So it's not about winning. I don't know where it came from. Okay. I just, just I want to get, get better. better. I want to get better. I want to be good at this. I want to be really good at this. So when you're looking at kids now as a coach, you're looking for that. Somebody yeah. who says... You know what? I kind of suck. I want to get better. And I, and I want to try to also inspire that. I, I mean, that, honestly, I think I think as a coach, that's probably my, my biggest job is to get a kid and get them to believe I can do this. Because if I can do this, what can I? I can, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can do that too, right? And there's so many kids who unfortunately have like shitty parents or bad teachers that tell them, you suck, you can't be anything, right? So I think my biggest goal as a coach is to get someone to believe they can do it. So actually some of the ones that believe they can do it, they're the most fun, but they're not the ones who need it, need it the most, right? The ones who think they can are the ones that need me the most. Yeah. Because they need someone to, let's go. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't know it, 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 what inspired me. I'm not sure. So age 
at age 11, fifth grade, I quit. I started, so then I started having more success, you know, what I'm like, say, placing at the state tournament. Um, in high school. Uh, so you, you right, fifth, sixth, so sixth grade, I placed at like the state, the local U state tournament, you know, so I'm like having more success. Um, seventh grade was the first year I won the youth state tournament. Um, so I'm getting better. Eighth grade, I actually feel like I got pretty good, but like when I went to the national tournaments, I was still having really minimal success. My freshman year, I decided to quit football. Same reason. It's like, well, I need to put more time into this. My parents, we got, my dad luckily got a mat in my basement. So, you know, there's no, so we have a year round club and our impetus was that we didn't have this opportunity to go to a club year round. Mm -hmm. So we had a mat in my basement. I had to go find, hey, you want to, you want to come wrestle? Like, well, yeah, to find partners for myself. What'd you do? Did you drill? Did you uh, live wrestle? What'd you do in that Um, basement? So actually, I think you'll enjoy this. I think the start of my scrambling was, was kind of based around that. So I got kind of, I think it's probably my freshman, sophomore. I'm kind of, the years are a little fuzzy, right? It's been yeah, a while. Sure. Um, but probably my freshman, sophomore, junior year, I found two kids who were really consistent, who would come out, like you would come out, on a, he'd come out on Tuesday and this dude would come out on a Wednesday, mm-hmm. right? And they would come every week and they were, they were really consistent partners for me to have in the summer. But they weren't nearly as good as me. They were way worse. So it's like, okay, how do I how do I make this kind of like fun and compelling for them to come back? If I, if I just whoop their ass, they're not going to come back, right. you know? So it was like, I would let them get as close as they could, as, as I thought they could do a takedown before not getting it and then try to like escape or get out. Mm-hmm. So obviously if I let them get really close, sometimes they get it, you know, so they're they're enjoying it. I don't know if they ever knew I was doing this, right? I have no idea. Um, and that, that was kind of like the start because I had to figure my way out of bad positions because mm-hmm. I had to try to make it, entertaining for them where they still got something out of it and they want to come back the next week. And I also got something out of it. Yeah, I love this. Yeah. Because that relationship is so important mm-hmm. with that, like that, I've uh, I've had a few drilling partners, training partners that were really important to my life. And I, I always wonder why it's difficult, why it's so difficult to find them. Yeah. Like I, if anyone's listening to this, I'm looking for a judo person in the I- Austin area actually. <sighs> Getting the reps with people is hard, even in jujitsu. Uh, that tr- it's just like people want to do the fun stuff; they don't want to really put in the work. Yeah, and it takes a certain kind of personality. And then you also have to make it fun for the other person, just like you said. If there's a skill mismatch, but also if you have an interest mismatch in terms of the the amount of drilling you want to do, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, you have to figure out ways to make it fun. Yeah, it's tricky. So you did. So okay. I, yeah, I think I did that and no one told me as so i get some i get frustrated because now we have you know just in my academy we probably have 50 60 high, high school kids only that are year round that they're year round you know maybe they're not as consistent in the summer or whatever but they're there so when they don't have a great partner they start whining it's like you little bitches like yeah. you know like i i some days i get really mad about it because it's like i had no partners i had to find freaking two partners yeah. to come twice a week you guys there's still 22 people in the room i'm sorry there's not the perfect partner for you but like go work out with that dude yeah you know yeah. And get it, yeah. So what was the switch that changed? Was or was it gradual or gradual? Was it, okay. Yeah. So uh, let's do it. So ninth grade, I quit football because I want to get really serious. Um, what position football? You I was actually a nose tackle, okay. and I was. But at that point, so I, okay. So I was also the other thing I kind of left off here. Is I was really fat growing up. Yeah. Uh, in, in sixth grade, I also decided, okay, I'm really fat, and if I want to be competitive wrestling, I shouldn't be fat because weight matters. I went from 130 pounds to 100 pounds in sixth grade. Um, nice. So by the time I was a freshman, I was 119. So I had I still wasn't as heavy as I was in sixth grade. So I was pretty small too, but I was also slow, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So uh, they put me in nose tackle. I you know I like the competitiveness, so I was decent at it. Um, so that's where you wrestled 119 freshman? my freshman year, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah, so then I still I started having a lot of success state wise, but not nationally. It's so my national success didn't come to like my junior year in high school. Um, but yeah, I was like grinding and getting better the whole time. And then senior year, I started having a lot of success nationally and I got recruited. And then, but then even in my freshman year of college, I, uh, this is where I, I love competing. I would go every weekend. Cause I knew I, if you, if you take the emotions out of competition, all it is, is seeing your failures, acknowledging them, and then figuring out what you need to work on. Yeah. Right. If we take all the emotion out of it, that's what it is. So I, I wrestled 50 matches as a redshirt freshman, which is incredibly rare. I had 10 losses. So it's not like, and like to not, not so great guys, you know? So like my, my skill level still at that point was not that great. And then the next year I came out and I made the NCAA finals. So 
my my I made a gigantic jump in that redshirt year to the to to the real freshman year. So a few questions. Yeah, where did the funk style of wrestling, the 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 creative stuff, get developed? At which stage? Yeah. So I so I think like looking retroactively, there was no there was no intention to start when I was in high school with those kids. But I think that's kind of like what what was happening, mm -hmm. right? So well, I, what I would really say is I, ha I had one influential coach my retro year of college named Mike Ironman, um, great guy. But then the second thing was it was just out of necessity. I had this burning desire to be the best. And when I was getting my ass kicked every day in the room, because we had, you know, Tyron was there. We had All-American 157. We had All-American 184. So I, I wasn't having a ton, ton of success. And very quickly, I realized from like a more traditional athletic perspective, strength and speed, I couldn't keep up with anyone. I was way worse. So it's like, okay, fuck, how do I, how do I do this? You know, I want to do this. How do I do this? I'm, there's, there's gotta be a way, you know? So Mike Ironman showed me a couple things, but then it was just like this creative expansion for the next, you know, three, say three to five years. Um, and then even now it's like, I, I don't know, there's something, and maybe you feel this way about judo or whatever. There's something that's like, fun about the way the body moves and works and 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 exploring something new and thinking about hey wrestling's been happening at a relatively high level for we'll say 80 to 90 years in america um and there's still new things being developed and so when you see something new you're like oh, damn like that's great or like jason nolf may have to win dixie i'm like how did i not think of that shit? <laughs> like why did i think of that? that's so easy i should i should have thought of that you know so there's this like obsession with the sport of wrestling and you know positions where um, I actually think sometimes think I wouldn't have smartphones because I may have been distracted by my smartphone. Maybe I wouldn't have been because I was so obsessed, but maybe. But you know, some days I I had couldn't finish the single leg on this specific person, or or they maybe they were finishing on me, and it was like go home and I just fucking obsess about that one position. Like, okay, how do what what am I missing here? And and not just accepting like that whatever the coach says is the answer, but like what am I missing? What ways can my body move? that no one's told me it can move yet. Where can my arms go, right? Where can I do all these things? And so I would just obsess about these things. And then, you know, sometimes you come in the next day and you say, oh, well, maybe this, you know? And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it works twice and then it doesn't work the next time. And, and so you kind of like have this creative process and it's like, you know, there's a lot of things that are on the cutting room floor that never made it to the, the light because you thought they'd be good and they failed and they sucked. And then, you know, to the point where like my senior year, um, I got to this point where the, the people, then they, they were just figures. Figures would wrestle in my head about positions I was thinking about. I wouldn't tell them what to do. They would just, they would just go in my head. And then like some, I, oh fuck, wait, that's it. That, that's it. Like, that just happened. That's the move. And then I'd go try to practice. And sure enough, wow. boom, that's the move. That's exactly what you have Alpha Zero playing, learning chess. You have, uh, the, the, <laughs> oh it's, no. It's, it's called self plays. Uh, you have, uh, what did the figures have, um, like, a no clear faces. They were just like, did they have a human form or is it just like stick figures essentially? Oh, yeah, it was not like, yeah, it was not like humans. It was more like stick figures. It wasn't stick figures exactly. Like they were, uh, so. They had some volume. They, yeah, it was like, it was like a gray person and they had, you know, three dimensions essentially because mm -hmm. I had to see how the things moved. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is exactly what uh, OpenAI and D uh, DeepMind and Google are, uh, I don't know if you've seen but there's something called reinforcement learning in artificial intelligence where yeah. you have like, they've done it for like sumo wrestling. You have, oh, really? you have like, you have these two stick figures that don't even know how to get up at first. And they figure out how to stand on their two feet. Mm. And then they figure out how to push the other person off of the, the, the pedestal. Wait, so, but what about like, uh, when you look at the, the Boston Dynamics, sometimes they have trouble with like, jumping and balancing and the other stuff. So yeah. are they are they doing that same program or no? No, 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 This it's different. The, uh, the, the, uh, everything Boston Dynamics is doing uh, is hard coded. So it's not, mm -hmm. um, it's not learning the, all the sophisticated movements and strategies, like high level strategies of movement, that's all mm -hmm. something that Boston Dynamics does not do. And if it does it, like the parkour stuff, that's all hard coded in. Oh. The people like project and think like these robots have like discovered like how to move in sophisticated ways they haven't. It well, seems... that's what when you and John were talking about the the grappling robot. Yeah, I mean the one thing I was I was obsessing about in my head is that with the chess, right? If a chess piece moves, right, uh, the horse can move like an L, right? 
it can only move like an L. It doesn't matter if it moves at two meters per second or seven meters per second. It can only move, it can only move there, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like a single leg, I can shoot a single leg with many different velocities. Mm -hmm. I can shoot at different angles. I can shoot with different amounts of force, right? I can shoot with my, my head up versus my head. I mean, right, all these things are gonna matter. If we're talking about a, a human being defending the single leg, all of those things are gonna matter. And, and that's where human beings are, uh, who wrestle are calculating those things subconsciously. They're obviously not consciously calculating in their head, oh, the the force is coming at me at this, so I need to do right. that, right? They're just doing it it's because- it's But see, the, the thing is, so you would absolutely, if you're doing a robot that you're wrestling, you're going to have to constrain the speed at which it moves and the power that it's able to uh, yes. deliver. So that presumably, there'll be the limitations. So then it'll be just the same exactly as a human. But then, but, so, but so even, so if we go human, Max force, right? Jordan Bros double max force, mm -hmm. right? That's the highest. That's the highest we get, and then we go down from there. Um, <laughs> even even with even within that, it's like yeah. sometimes I can shoot a single leg with a maximum force of I don't. We'll just say we'll just say twenty. This is a number, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Shoot it at twenty because I feel sometimes I shoot at fifteen. Sometimes I shoot at twelve, right? Because mm -hmm. you you feel something in oh, your yeah. opponent that makes you do it differently. Yeah. So they would have to learn how, and, and then you know all of these different things. And sometimes maybe I clamp a little harder. So the the robot would have to learn all of these different incoming inputs to the system and mm -hmm. then create this reaction. Oh, no, 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 100%. So this would be all continuous. Like, yeah. uh, so unlike chess, it would not be, it's just chess is discrete. There's, it's- uh, One then- the You move, it's, it's, a, it's a very specific set of moves. No, yeah. here you would, those are all variables you control and they're continuous variables. So the speed, the force, there's actuators. So there's all these joints, right? That, yeah. That you can move. I mean, it's just an optimization problem. It's kind of fa it was, it was fascinating. So I've been fascinated thinking about it since you guys talked about it. When I, it was a long time ago. I listened to it probably three, three to four weeks ago, and I've <laughs> kind of been like obsessing about it ever since. Be well, yeah, it just changes when. Um, so unlike boxing, for example, or striking, it, it, you know, once you grab a hold of somebody, it it change. You're now one body, mm -hmm. right? So it's, yeah. it's very complicated. It's not just shooting a a double leg without like maybe doing like like faking a double leg and then shooting the double leg that's very doable with robotics but mm -hmm. then like doing a clinch and from there doing like a russian tie like mm -hmm. that yeah I, th that's uh, i think that's way harder than people realize in terms of how many things are involved like the force of the grip the leverage you're providing with all the different parts of the shoulder and the arm and the torso, the twist, how much of your weight are you allocating, like leaning on the other person, yeah. like taking weight off of one of your legs and the other leg, all of that. I, I think that's the really interesting thing about humans is we're able to do all of this calculation. Subconsciously. Yeah, subconsciously. Yeah, yeah and that's what I've been thinking about since we, uh, it's like how many things, even these high school athletes who are like getting medium good, are subconsciously thinking about all the time, or not even not even thinking about, sorry, reacting to. Um, but then even like for me, I'm you know I'm a few orders of magnitude better than some of these kids I play. And so when I when I go like super hard, it's like I can feel their weight moving the wrong direction. And so for me to off balance them or trip them or whatever is kind of easy sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not feeling it the right way, right? Or their timing's just a little bit off or the way they're grabbing the hip, maybe they should be up a little higher, right? Mm -hmm. These really small things. Um, yeah, I think that's all easy to take advantage of for a robot It's just, there's so many things. The, the big problem is ethically, I don't know how many people are willing to train with a robot because you're gonna get hurt. Well, can you make a robot train with a robot or no? Yes, but then it's expensive. So, because they're gonna put the padding on that thing. I know, but that, but then it's not, you know, it, it, it's <laughs> then uh, that you're not get, capturing the full. Why can't you put like some rubber coating on them, or, you know, something to that effect? You could. I mean, th you could. Yeah, you could. I mean, you're talking about robots that are so these are humanoid robots, so we're talking about five hundred thousand million dollar robots. Mm -hmm. So. You would have to be motivated. <laughs> spend a lot of money. To spend a lot of money because you have to have them wrestle for like a lot. To get better. Yeah, to get better. Yeah. And then the the open question is how long does it take to get good enough to beat a human? Uh, <laughs> I'd, 
I don't I don't think I don't think we understand. I don't know. I don't think you understand how hard wrestling is. Yeah. Like, is it a really hard problem? Like, what's harder, chess or wrestling? Wrestling, by far. Not even close. That's yeah. That's the sense. So because I have. there's an infinite amount of moves, right, uh, and possibilities. So once I shoot the single leg, now you have X amount of choices. Once you make your choice, now I have a choice. X amount of choices. Now, I, now you have X amount of choices on the defense, and we can just keep going back and forth, right? And this number becomes. Yeah, but the same happens with chess. Correct, but then in wrestling, you have to make these movements in very instantaneously, right? Because if I shoot a single leg, I'm not going to wait and say, "What's your defense?" Yeah, right. You have to make it instantaneously, and then. Also, again, based on the force and the vectors and, and the angles, you have to calculate that and adjust. So really, you know, if you're saying, well, I can shoot a single leg, it's not like moving the chest, it's not one move, right? It's if you want to talk about different forces and stuff, it, it could be hundreds or thousands of different moves based on how hard I shoot it, the angle, the direction, all of those things. Yeah, but wait a minute. So robots can do this kind of stuff really fast. You, what I, People probably know the physiology of this, but it's... The, the reaction speed for a human is maybe 100 milliseconds, something like that. I okay. don't know, from sensation to, to, to like from the, the signal traveling up your, to your brain and down, okay. I don't know what that number is, but uh, robots certainly could do it way faster. It, you would actually have to like constrain the speed. Well, so the robots are already killing the chess people, yes. right? Yeah. So yeah, theoretically they could eventually beat wrestlers, but you asked what was hard wrestling or chess. Yeah. And I think wrestling is because of the time component in it and then the and and the physicality of, you know, is it this force or that force? You know, because if if I'm gonna say say we're in a seatbelt side by side, right? A wrestling seatbelt, not mm-hmm. jujitsu. Based on the pressure you're giving me, I might do a bunch of different things, right? And so like to an untrained eye, they might both look like the same thing from you to a trained feel. It's like, well, in one case, it's really evident I should go this way. In another case, it's really evident I should go that way. So you the know? other thing to consider, just like with chess, the AI systems, so human versus human play a certain way together. They actually haven't considered a really large number of strategies that AI systems discover. So one possibility with a robot, they'll discover certain ties and certain takedowns. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that like will dominate no matter what the human does. You think that, so you think there's that, so this, I mean, this is what I'm talking about with the wrestling so fun is there's, even after 80, 90 years, there's this continuous yeah. evolution. Yeah. So you There'll think- There'll be some like low happens. single type thing, like John Smith type of situation. Well, It'll like just, a down block go behind is something that has really, I would say really in the last five-ish years has really been evolved. What's a go behind? Down block go behind. So when you shoot, well, they, they just head inside or head outside matters, but there's one for both. You shoot at me, essentially, I take my leg, like, boom. And then, so that was kind of in existence when I was in college, right? You down block them and you stop, but usually you hit on this side of their head, right? Mm-hmm. And now immediately as you shoot, I attack that shoulder and then I start hitting a go behind mm-hmm. on you, right? And so like that in, in its current incarnation, it absolutely wasn't around when I was in college. I would say it probably became popular I don't know, f- five to seven years ago. So yeah, there's these big things that are happening. It, now, now I really want a robot because I want to be ahead of the game. I want to know like, exactly. what I'm missing. I mean, one interesting thing you have with Alpha Zero that plays chess is um, it sacrifices pieces much more than humans do. So it'll give you a piece. Mm. And not only does it give you a piece, it will wait a bunch of moves before it makes you pay. So Because it knows that that's better for the long yeah, term. Long term. So like humans rarely sacrifice without getting the piece back like two or three moves after uh alpha zero can wait like five moves so wow. so basically you'll have you potentially with wrestling you might have a a robot that like puts itself in bad positions but in a certain kind of way that that will actually lures the opponent in out. to trap <laughs> exactly what my style is based on <laughs> You basically narrow one one thing to do is you narrow the set of choices. You put yourself in a bad position, but it narrows the set of choices for them because they're not used to it. Yeah, they're not used to it, and and then you you drag them into uh, into your yeah. So, but there's also the problem is there's mechanical issues. Like it's actually just difficult to build robots that uh, are able to sense because we have sensation throughout our body. Yeah. It's just difficult to build that kind of robot. It's expensive. You start talking about multi multi million dollars, yeah. and then people start asking you questions. Why did you invest all of this money? I don't want to see what moves they do. <laughs> Duh. Hello. It could be a better investment. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned John Smith. 
uh, he is, if people don't know, one of the great wrestlers, wrestling coaches ever. He's also creative like you. Yeah. He spoke really highly of you. What do you think about that guy? Did you guys ever work together? Not really. Uh, so, I, so you know what? When I was a senior and I had the people wrestling in my head, uh, I was lucky enough to be doing, um, I was pretty much graduated. So I did an independent study with the sports psychology. I was potentially going to go to uh, grad school for sports psych. Well, I actually did nine credits and then I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore. I would, I would continue learning on my own. Um, but I had an independent study with uh, the guy who was the head of USA track and field sports psych. So I, so the, the here was the, the class was, I got to go sit down and talk with him for an hour and he was like fascinated by me. So he didn't really make me do homework. It was like the greatest three credits ever. <laughs> we just talked, it was, I learned so much. It was so yeah. awesome. Um, but so I started, so one time it came up that I had these robot or people wrestling in my head, you know? And he said, well, who else do you think? I said, I bet John Smith happened. So I went and got John Smith's number and called him and said, hey, you ever had these people wrestling in your head? And he said, yeah, but as soon as I stopped coaching, they went away. Same thing happened to me. As soon as I started coaching, they went away. So if I really force myself now and I'm like, I, you know, I see something in practice. So, and it's really higher level because high school wrestling, I don't want to make you guys feel bad, but it's like, it's a little bit lower level, right? So if like Keegan, for example, who won the journey, if he's struggling with a problem or asked me a question and I can force myself to like see the bodies moving and think about it again, you know, kind of like I was in the early age, but it won't just, it won't just flow there anymore. So he said it went away. And for me, it went away also. By the way, if you can pause on, on the, on the, <laughs> on the bodies in your head yeah uh what like how are they generating new ideas are they just kind of i don't know you tell me so it's <laughs> just they're just like it would, scrambling it would, in your head it would be specifically based on a, a problem i was struggling with or a, or a specific position okay, you know so kind of it goes in for a single and then and then go from there yeah so like i'm sitting in geography class and you know i don't have to work that hard because it's easy right and uh yeah, I'm just sitting there like kind of acting like I'm looking at the board and these guys are wrestling and I'm watching them wrestle. And yeah, sometimes they come up with a, a really good solution. Is there somebody you, you uh, looked up to style-wise? Like Not, Gable, John Smith, yeah, all these like like legend status people. Probably Gable, or it's a Gable, um, John Smith, but after the fact. So the problem with wrestling in my era was you couldn't watch it. There was no there was no access, right? It wasn't, it wasn't really available. Even if you want to say, Go find a bunch of John Smith, Matt. They're kind of hard to find, right? There's a couple of them on YouTube, but I've obviously seen all of those. But in in my era, there was there really wasn't any of it, so it was hard to be a fan of something. And that's why wrestling wrestling has his the fans are going like this because now you know you flip on the Flow app and you can watch uh, you know something that's happening in Europe, right? We can do this easily, so we can be a fan of people. Um, so now I'm more a fan of wrestling than I was then because there just was no access. So now I can watch someone I like and say, oh shit, like that guy's wrestling. Oh, boom, I flip my phone on, I watch them wrestle, you know, that type of thing. You know, on a quick rant, it's really frustrating that you can't watch the Olympics. Oh my God, it's so frustrating. I, I've been, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna go to war on Go to point. NBC's headquarters, I'll go with you. You, you, got a, you got a soldier here. I was talking to Jimmy, I, uh, Jimmy Pedro, he was surprised by this too. Most matches, you can't see even you talk about like a uh, comeback uh, Gable Steels and yeah you can't see the full match you well, get like a crappy yeah. highlight. So the two the two biggest things in and really the three the NCAA championships on ESPN yeah the World Olympic trials are on NBC and the Olympics are on NBC and these th these these companies are so big they don't have a department dedicated to selling the rights to that footage mm -hmm. right so the, the the rights to wrestling footage which no one really cares all that much about except a, a niche are the exact same as track and field or and or basketball in the olympics so yes all of this stuff is completely inaccessible to us the the ncas the olympic trials and the olympics yeah. you can't go watch old film on it it sucks so yeah bad. old or current film yeah uh so you can't even watch the gable match the Gable Stevens, no. They did a, you know, they do something that annoys the fuck out of me. What? Okay. They, 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 they do like a three or two minute highlight. Mm. So it's like they capture the, the most important thing, but like it's all about the buildup. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, that very beginning when you step on the mat and the nerves and you walk out and like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Uh, you miss then then when the the triumph happens or the heartbreak happens it has that much more power 
Yeah, if you want to go to war with NBC or ESPN, I'm I'm happy to join well, that. I think, unfortunately, this is bullshit. It's the IOC. Well, I mean, uh, does the IOC own that? Or is it, uh, IOC is selling the for the Olympics is the one that's making. Well, so NBC broadcasts, so they obviously have the live rights. You would think they would have recorded if they. I mean, they're the ones recording it. You would think they keep the rights when you think. No, so. no, no. I they're li- getting a license of it. They're getting exclusive like license, but like the you know, for example. Uh, I've had this, I talked to Travis Stevens, the judo player, and there's a really sort of famous match, it's a heartbreak in his career from uh, 2012 Olympics where he goes against a German, Ole Bischoff, whatever. It's a 20 minute match to go to war and that's not available anywhere, but it's uploaded on YouTube and (laughs) set to private. The reason I know this is be, uh, on the IOC channel. So they've uploaded all of these matches. They haven't they put it up? Like they had, uh, so actually, so my Olympic match, the the one I won, got put public. And I, so I don't know if it was private. It got put up on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, I was alerted to it the week of my Jake Paul fight. It was so dumb. I'm like, what? This is every 13 years later. This is yeah. bullshit. Like, yeah. this should have been up. So, uh, I mean, what, okay, so what about... Olympic trials footage that has to be the USOC then or NBC. Uh, so I know, like, okay, so I know Flow, right? Because I work yeah. for them. I know if Flow buys your event or whatever, right? They, they buy the rights. Generally, in the contract, they'll have rights to both live stream it and then use that footage at any point moving forward. Yeah. So those matches live on Flow's website. That's why I would be surprised that if NBC didn't have something similar. Flow does a pretty good job of providing, like, a uh, a place where you can watch all these matches. Yeah. NBC does not. Does not, yeah. yeah. And, and and also there's an argument with Flo as well, but certainly with Olympics. There's a difference between what Flo does and what the Olympics represent. What like, do you mean by that? Like, it feels like the Olympics, which is what the charter says, should be as accessible as possible. Yes, like, that's true. Like, you should really lower the barrier for entry for the Olympics. Right? You know that's what the charter says, but those people in the IOC, those, we just them the worst people ever. Yeah. They're very bad. Well, they're not They're not bad. They just lost touch of the dream they once had when they joined the IOC. Well, I would argue, I would argue all the way back that these are rich, fat cats who, like, I get so mad about the NCA, which finally now got rid of this term, bullshit term, amateurism. It's like, well, there's some holy grail where you can't make money to be an amateur athlete. But the people who own the IOC or the people who own the institutions, college institutions are making boatloads of money off of you. That's crap. So you competed, like you said, at the 2008 Olympics. Mm -hmm. Did you believe you can win gold? Yeah, absolutely. So your mental game was on point. Yeah, I was ready. So what what went wrong? This wasn't good enough. That was what I said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so at that point in time, um, I it was my first year of international competition. So when I came out in 2007, it was my first time making 74 kilograms, which is pretty small for me. Um, I had some failures, but then quickly I turned that around and I was having success uh, in America. I was beating everyone. I don't want to say easy, but it, I, yeah, it was, you know, I was, I was doing really well. Um, I went international one time and I, I, there was one match I got cheated on. The Russians, they're cheaters. <laughs> I think she was U- Ukraine, not Russia. Um, I lost one real match where I actually lost. Um, and it was to Dennis Sargush, who would go on to win three world titles. But he was by- behind the T of that year. Mm-hmm. And it was competitive, you know? So I knew, okay, I'm like, I'm going with the best guys in the world. Uh, I beat a bunch of other guys who, you know, were were good and had passed decent results. So like, I knew I was like right there. Unfortunately, I ran into this guy, Ivan Fundora, and in I had someone do scouting reports for him, actually my high school coach who now coaches for our academy, John Messamrink, and Fundora was the worst stylistic matchup. I got him, um, and I lost him second round. So yeah. I, just, I wasn't good enough. I, you know, I Had I decided to keep wrestling, I probably would have gotten better, but at that point in time, this wasn't in the cards. So in your division was, like you said, Satyev, mm-hmm. Vice Vice Satyev. Um, that guy is special. He's very special. So oh. that would be my other guy that you asked earlier who I enjoyed watching. And that was a guy I, again, it was kind of after the fact because it was hard to access footage, but he yeah, he was a lot of fun to watch. What do you think made him great? Uh, a he, lot of people talked to, about him as potentially one of the great, oh, greatest yeah, yes, ever. Absolutely. I mean, six and so he won six and three, six worlds, nine, uh, 
six worlds, three Olympics, nine total, which there's only one or two people above that. Um, so again, it was it was hard to watch any live footage of him, but from what I've seen, it, his his feel is different. He was just ahead of his time in the feel and the touch he had for certain moves and different things, because obviously physically he's kind of un, unimposing. Mm -hmm. He's um, you know taller and skinnier, which is you know it, it, it can work in wrestling, but it is by less represented. Um, yeah, he was special. So good. Do you uh, take any inspiration from? Let's talk about Dagestan in general. What do you, what do you think makes those wrestlers great? Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I, have you read the book, The Talent Code? Yeah. It's great. And that kind of talks about these talent hotspots all around the world. And so now, obviously with our wrestling academies, we try to take some lessons from the, that and apply it. I got to assume, they didn't cover Dagestan in, in that book specifically, but I got to assume a lot of the same principles uh, that are in that book apply to Dagestan and wrestling, right? They did South Korea and... Um, women's golf, they did Curacao and baseball, right? They picked a lot of these other places that were really elite. Uh, I think it was maybe Moscow and women's tennis also. Um, and I, so I think all these things that make any group great or organization is probably the same things that's happening there. Well, the hardship, I mean, what for, for, is there something specific about wrestling that can create so many great champions? Is it From that area, so obviously they're all, they all, love it. like it's a big deal that wrestling is specifically is a big deal there you know they do sambo also obviously um so that's part of it is a lot of the kids are doing it they obviously are rough tumble tough yeah. tough life um, a lot of fights and then i think that also that a lot of them it, it is a way out right there the the elite level athletes in that part of the world from my understanding are really well compensated compared to what the average person makes and they're treated really well so people see it as a way out whereas like and then honestly if America is getting better, but in 2008, the reason I went to do MMA was because I didn't want to be poor my whole life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It sucked. It's like, well, I don't want to make $20,000 for the next 48 years, so I'm going to go do something else. If I could have made, even, and I didn't need to be rich, right? If I could have made $100,000 or $70,000 wrestling, I probably, probably would have kept wrestling. Um, so I think I think it's those factors. I And obviously now they have a really like, uh, a bunch of really good people in one area, so there's probably and it's been going on for a long time. So there's probably been a bunch of like adults and coaches that are coming back and helping that progress. So yeah, a lot of those things that happen. So I'm definitely gonna travel there to talk to him because I can speak Russian. It oh, makes nice. it makes it very, um, makes me uniquely qualified to-, uh, to <laughs> My brother can speak a little bit of Russian. Your brother can? Yeah. Okay, like yeah. a little bit like two uh, squares and- no, 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 like he would, Oh man, don't don't make me oversell. I think he would be able to have a conversation with you. I think. Okay. okay. Probably not like you. <laughs> what's the uh, What's the reason he knows Russian? He I don't know why he got obsessed with languages, and so his college degree is actually um, what do they call interdis, where you have three minors. So he had a minor in Russian, a minor in Spanish, and maybe Japanese. I'm I'm messing up. It's definitely it's Russian and Spanish are for sure. I don't know what the third one is. No, but yeah, Dagestan, it's its really fascinating. But the the, uh, the emphasis on technique, the lighter drilling, like they don't yeah. really go super hard. Yeah, and I only spent a couple, so I was there, I was in Vladikavkaz in 2008, that was where the World Cup was. We had to train there for like two days afterwards. So um, I didn't get to dig deep, did get to dig deep into what was going on or anything. But yeah, I mean, I think sparring has, uh, sparring is, very beneficial for wrestling. Um, not like sparring in MMA is we fight, mm -hmm. right? Sparring in wrestling is, so I always just describe it to be really simple. Uh, if we're drilling, it's relatively 0% resistance. If we're going as hard as we can, that's 100%. Mm -hmm. There's all this gray area in the middle, that's sparring, right? And so, you know, if you have a good relationship, like, you know, especially in college, me and my brother, we could just go and we, we know where each other's at. We don't even have to talk about it, right? But like in my wrestling club, we'll say, okay, hey, I want you guys to go 50% in this position. Or I want the high crotch guy, I want him to shoot, and this is for him, so I want him to go 70. And the defensive guy, I want you to go 40. So you're not you're not supposed to be trying to win here. You're gonna mm -hmm. go a little later. I want you to give, give him some looks, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think, I think it has really taken hold in America. I think it's really beneficial for success. And I think that's, I mean, America's doing better than we've ever done historically. Well, well that's 70 and 40. That's like an art form to find that right place. Cause, yes. uh, like what the, the the really good people I've trained with, they go c much closer to a hundred percent speed wise, mm -hmm. or like, but without like 
forcing things yeah. the way you would when you're going. It's some weird combination of things that, like, if you truly earn a technique, then you're given that technique. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, if you don't, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> and and then it becomes a, a much less injury prone. It becomes somehow mm-hmm. more fun, more dynamic. Yeah. You don't get stuck in positions. It's just a lot of movement. Yeah, the one thing, so you you and John talked about, uh, you know, like different ways to learn and get better. And so I think John obviously innovated within the sport of jujitsu. Um, and, and so for us, one of the, and maybe there's a, just a differentiator for us. <clears throat> I think about so, it. Like, so sorry to interrupt. You have this academy and you sent me this plan that you have yeah, like yeah. a really well thought through plan for how to develop a good wrestler. Yeah. So, but I, so I think it's, um, so for me, there's four categories, right? There's the teaching which is like, you don't know shit. I'm, you're coming in and I'm showing you the move mm-hmm. and you're literally going out there and you're trying. To me, that's not even drilling. Mm-hmm. That's like teaching, like yeah. you're trying to learn something. So obviously in someone's earlier periods, they're spending a lot yeah. of time in that phase because they literally don't even know how to move their bodies the right way. Mm-hmm. Once you learn the skill, then there's the drilling because you need to, you absolutely have to get those reps to become really proficient in that movement and then the sparring and then the live, right? And so like, I think obviously by the time you get to the kind of, I don't want to say end point, right? But further on, the time you spend teaching is so, I don't want to say, in, I'm sorry, in the learn, learning teaching phase is not insignificant, but so much smaller because to someone who's really good, who I've coached for 10 years, I don't have to give this big, long drawn out explanation. I just have to say, hey, move, move your hand a little differently, mm-hmm. right? Or just do this. Yep. Right, we don't have to spend any time there. So I think that's like something that consumes for the younger kids, say five through twelve or thirteen, we're consuming a massive amount of time there on that mm-hmm. teaching learning phase. And then as we get older, that time wanes a lot. But that makes total sense, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's funny because when you look at like jujitsu schools, they spend a lot of time in the teaching, learning, and then the live. It feels like there's not enough drilling. Yeah. I like how you draw a distinction there. Yeah. Because it, it feels it feels like you're always starting from scratch. Like people have like very crappy short term memory. Like they, they're not uh, like the way teaching is done is you show a technique from scratch. Mm-hmm. And I just it seems disjoint. It is for sure. Especially if you have a class that's been with you for a while. Yeah. You don't have to start from scratch. You can yeah. say, Hey, let's focus on this one little thing here. Yeah. yeah. Or let's after we do this, let's do that, you know, and you kind of put start putting it all together. And then with jujitsu, the thing I, I really struggle with was was a couple things it was um and this is not speaking for all the jiu the my my personal experience through the sport and i actually found my so when i unretired i found someone really great that i loved and i really wish it was mark layman i don't know if you mm-hmm. know him at all i wish i would have found him earlier because he was just tremendous um but number one there's no drilling so it's like in wrestling i can boil down to i can probably name you the best six moves, right? Mm-hmm. So we need, as, as younger people, single leg, right? Single leg's gonna be the most proficient takedown. It always has been, I don't know, probably always will be unless they yeah, figure out something different. Um, <laughs> the robot. <laughs> the robot figures out different. We're gonna shoot a lot of single legs. Why? Because we're because everyone's gonna do that, right? We're gonna shoot a lot of single legs. Mm-hmm. So just like say an arm bar or some type of sweep, right? Why can't we go get 50 reps there? Hey, we. I mean, by the time I've been in your jiu-jitsu school for two years, I better know a fucking arm bar. Mm-hmm. I better know it. So don't don't spend 10 minutes teaching me. Just tell me to go hit 50 reps. And then if when I'm hitting my reps, if there's something I'm doing wrong, then just say, hey, Ben, move your leg a little bit that way or raise your hips up a little more, right? Like correct as you're drilling. So you're getting all these reps at it. So you're becoming more proficient. And then the other thing I really struggled with was to your point during live, so many times it's just this five minute go, go, Mm -hmm. go. And that's not the most efficient way to learn because when you have two people, especially when they're focused on winning, and you say, go, they're going to go to whatever they do best. Mm-hmm. Well, if I'm trying to make you good at something, I don't want you doing what you do best all the time. I need you doing some other things, right? If you have a great single leg, but you can't shoot to the other side of their body, well, we need to work on that, right. right? You need to start shooting the other side. I, there's some sense that you, it's not like you should be told what to work on, but you should be told to work on the thing that you want to work on. Meaning, because I, I, I don't know, about, maybe you can comment on this, but you know, everybody develops a, a different game as you get better and better. Yeah. There's a set of things you need to be working on. So I actually have, uh, like when I, especially when I'm like training very seriously, I'll have a specific technique that I have in mind. And I have a sh- sh- sheet of paper on the side 
where I literally, my head keep counting off how many times I put myself in that position and pulled off the technique. And that's yeah. all I care about Yeah. in like training. So I'll just, uh, uh, whatever it is, if it's a guillotine, it's a guillotine, arm drag, arm drag. But I want to make sure I don't, I love numbers. So <laughs> I'll, I'll say like, uh, I'll make sure I get 50 arm drags yeah. and I'm not getting off the mat until I do. And that, you know, if it takes- it's drilling or a live contest? Uh, so in this, in the thing I'm describing right now is the live contest. Okay, got it. But drilling, obviously, drilling. So I feel like I, I can't like, find a drilling part. Like it's so hard to find drilling partners. Even so, boring. It's it's annoying to me that this is boring. And there's nothing more <laughs> annoying to me than the look of boredom on another person's face when we're drilling. Yeah, it's like. Do you really you... think drilling is that beneficial to you? Because you said that it's a job. Yes. Yes. And really? he thinks I'm an idiot. But yes. Why? Why am I, am I an idiot or why no. is it really beneficial? <laughs> uh, well, let's go, let's see what your explanation is. <laughs> why is it so beneficial? Um, I think for me, it's there's a meditative aspect to it where the more you drill, the more you start noticing the the details. Okay, let, the me, let me push minute back details. a little yeah. bit here. I'm not gonna push back all the way because um, so every time if I was wrestling, I wore my head crouching like whatever, right? But even so, say like at a high level, when I'm really wrestling say, 10 years ago, um, even during that drill portion, if we talk about the resistance of our opponent from zero to 100, um, it's very likely that my partner at that point, because it's people I'm really comfortable with, they're probably at least going 20 or 30, right? They're probably giving me a certain look with the sprawl or, you know, I got to get through their hands. If I, if I don't set it up right, they might put their arm down, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it, it, we are drilling because we're, we're wrestling at a really low resistance level, mm -hmm. but there's a little bit of sparring. Oh, yeah, to yeah. the 20%, too, you know? the 20, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's, that's not, not really drilling. Cause I, I think of drilling, I think literally you're shooting and I'm, I'm just going to boom, I'm going to be your dummy. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. Type of thing. No, you know? but it's very hard to be a dummy that doesn't do twenty percent. So you're gonna do twenty percent, yeah. That's yeah. so so yes, yeah. that's twenty percent. But so that's like sparring a little bit then. No, but they're not really resisting. They're just a giving you bit. the right frame. They're they're giving you the right like movement and they're being they're being an intelligent dummy, essentially. Yeah. Hmm. I mean uh, but also like the really important component of this is you pick the techniques for which it's beneficial. If the technique is has dynamic elements to it you don't want to be doing that with i'm saying like there's certain moves and i like those moves and i select the game based on those moves that like so are you drilling to get better or are you drilling just to work out no to get better that's what i'm trying to tell you i i believe you can become like exceptionally good very fast by drilling but how but first of all <laughs> let me let me ask you an empirical Wait. question let me have have you actually drilled 10,000 times a Absolute particular move. Millions. Millions. You haven't drilled millions. Hundreds okay. of thousands. Hundreds of thousands, likely. I so think I you're just saying, saying numbers. No, no, I don't no, think the, you the know what 100,000. It's astronomical. It's way more than 10,000. I don't think hey, you listen, know what 100,000 feels like. There was like. a 10-year period where I wrestled every single day. That's yeah. that's uh, 3,000 days. So you're telling me 10,000, that's only three of them a day. I did way more than that. Three of them. Probably did 30 of them a day. That's, that's 100,000. Yeah. Yeah, hundreds of, hundreds of thousands. I'm, I doubt for you sure. did 30 a day for a I did, technique. For I am for sure, 100%. Okay. There's no doubt. All right. Because some days I might do 100, right? Yeah. So 30, 30 is not very many, especially mm. if we count all reps, if we're counting drilling and live. So like our coach, college coach would make us just drill a lot and I always hated it. So I would I would rebel and just kind of give a little spar. You, know, you shoot a high crotch, we'll start. You Coach wants to drill a high crotch. Okay, we'll start. You shoot the high crotch, that's great. Then I'm gonna sit the corner, I'm gonna give you my hip or I'm gonna, mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna try something. So then you have to react. And, and I would argue that um, all skill level past like the beginner stuff is is some necessity of that, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this, then what are you gonna do? It's, it's back and forth. I shoot a single leg, what are you gonna do? I shoot a high crotch, what are you gonna do? And you have to start unconsciously programming these things in your head because if you have to consciously think about it, it's gonna to be too slow to actually hit it in a match. But right? the drilling is the unconscious programming. But but the simple movement, the, the first simple movement, the first simple movement, that single leg yeah. or the high crotch or arm drag, whatever. Like, I feel like the amount you're gonna get better at it is so minuscule compared to the amount you're gonna gain at doing other things around it. You see? Yeah, no, but that's the key word, you feel. Okay, that's I, your opinion. I think if we did a if we did a study on it, that I would be proven correct. No, uh, perhaps. So first of all, your brain as an exceptionally creative combat athlete, it's clear that you don't like the boredom of drilling. 
Like it, it's obvious that you that you have like you're such a creative energy yeah. that you're just not going to be somebody who's going to enjoy that. So enjoyment is probably having an active mind is really important. Yeah. So the, the the question is, do you have the kind of makeup that has an active mind during a drilling on a dummy? And I have that mind. Like but I, I can, do you really think, okay, so if you're, uh, let's pick a technique. What technique do you want to drill a lot? Are we doing jiu-jitsu or wrestling? Whatever you want. Um, it's hard to describe with words, but certain guard passes. Uh, let me let me think, just the guard pass. Okay, so you have a guard pass and you get it to be a, as a nine and a half out of 10, right? Just mm -hmm. from, a, from a technical standpoint. Don't you think you need some resistance to feel? Because essentially all, all benefit after that is going to be, what are they going to try to do to me? And if they ship the hip that way, do I need to, do I need to sink oh, yeah, here yeah. or move there? So it's like, I, so I, I, I actually think we're agreeing, but maybe terminology the, wise. Well, the split is the important thing, like how much of each. So, so, so I think it is spar. Like, I, I think it's a very light touch spar is what you're talking about, which is in my opinion, really isn't drilling. And it's because drilling past the basic proficiency, I don't think brings much value. No, but that's what I'm trying to tell you is I think it does. I think I think um, uh, if you're doing that same movement, I think you begin to learn more over time. Like you're saying, like once you get the basic proficiency, then there's uh, diminishing returns. I don't think yes, so. Yes, that's what I think. I don't think so. I think everything has diminishing returns when you're learning a technique. Like, but with something as complex as wrestling or grappling, um, if if you can have way more gains over here, why focus on going from a, a nine point seven to a nine point eight? If if you if this other area, if you're spending so much time here that this other area is left unexplored, and you can make gigantic gains over there. No, but you're gonna lose. I I think a lot depends on your style. I think a lot is determined by how good you are at one thing. And so if you want to be, become a master of a particular thing, and then make your whole game where it's all pulled into that mm -hmm. system. Then I don't know. I think one is too small of a number. Not, yeah, you, small. I, I feel like you can't be easily this. Like I, I yeah. You want you want to funnel. You want to create funnels. 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 Right. Where everything goes into a few positions. And then it's where all I feel. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel you can get like drilling on a dummy eighty percent of the time and twenty percent of the time live rolling with people worse than you like a little bit worse than you or a lot worse than you. Yeah, so I think, so I think, I definitely think, so my my buildup would be um, teach, so we're talking complex technique, right? So by the time we're I'm talking about, we'll say a late, a late high school kid who's pretty proficient, um, he's probably done the drilling part. So then now it's like, okay, if I want to get something new to you, I'll probably tell you, you'll probably be able to do the basic premise within five to 10 minutes if they're mm -hmm. good, right? do this, okay, they do it. Then it's like, okay, so now here from here, what are we gonna do? We're gonna to go light sparring, so I know you have success, because I need you to complete the task in order to get better at it. That's something a lot of people in wrestling mess up, is they just wanna go to the toughest person. But if you go to the toughest person, you're not gonna actually execute on any skills. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get a workout, but you're not, and I need you to execute, because I need you to get good at this. In order to get good at it, you have to get all the way through the technique. Why do you need them to complete, so just so they gain confidence in the technique, or they go through they all have the to feel, the They have to feel all the way through, like if I said, Learn a high crotch when you're drilling, but stop halfway every time. But you're not right. actually going to be able to do it because you're going right. to stop. You're not going to right. feel. So you know, try it on someone spar lightly, get it. Do it on someone who's not as good as you, get it. Then kind of work your way up the ladder until you can get it on someone your own skill level or maybe better than you, mm -hmm. right? In a, in a live competition. So it's like I don't know. I feel like that that basic drilling, like uh, so, a kid like Keegan who I brought up a few times, like. I feel like if there's something, something new, I could literally tell him like, this is what I want you to do. And he's such a great feel like he could go drill it proficiently within probably a minute or two. But then to hit it on someone high level, that's gonna take quite a while longer. And that's a mix of drilling and sparring, uh, sparring on people a little bit worse than you. Yeah, and then be yeah, and then e equal and then better, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because there's 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 just with with grappling, right? There's such like a feel component to the the pressure, the movement, and all these things. And there's still, like I said, there's so many things you can throw at someone out of one position, not just moves, but moves at different levels of force or or whatever. Are you and these kids developing like a big picture strategy of like what are the main setups and takedowns and just like a whole system? 
Um, so we, you know, as I, I kind of sent you our technique book, right, and how yeah. we kind of go at uh, approach it. So I, I think in wrestling, you're going to need you're going to need a handful of things just off the off the word go, right? You're going to. So I think on our feet, I need to build tech this side of the body. I need to build tech that side of the body. I need to be able to bring you underneath me. I need to be able to go around you, mm -hmm. right? Now we can accomplish those different ways, but we should have all of those weapons if we want to be really good some way, right? Um, so if I neglect one of those, so if I neglect the ability to say, pull you down, right, front hand lock you. Um, now, if I have a good shot and you're smart, you're just gonna lower your stance. So my shot is not gonna be as successful mm. and I have the inability to pull you down, right? So I kind of need all of those so I can, as they get better, I can point those things out. Um, on bottom, my folks out bottom, there's certain things like you have to be good at leg right defense, mm -hmm. right? You have to, I mean, at a high level, or you're just gonna, you're gonna get, when you get it in, you're just gonna get stuck there. Not gonna be able to escape. Um, but besides that, yeah, there's a, there's a multitude of things that you can choose from. And I'm gonna, depending on your body style uh, and what you're good and bad at, I'm gonna probably develop something a little different. I might give you, hey, you do the quad pod, you'd be better with a knee slide, whatever. Um, yeah, and top kind of same thing. I have to ask you about Khabib. So I remember a while ago, Rogan said that uh, that's the perfect fight uh, yeah. for Khabib, you are. So let me ask two questions. The first, do you think you can beat him in an MMA match when you're at your peak? Yeah. I, I don't like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those people where people like will get really mad at me if I say yes, but yeah, I mean- But I how think, would you do it? How would you solve that puzzle? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we would grapple and I think I would be better than him, but I, you know, I, I, I feel weird saying this people, well, like, yeah, right, you're full of shit, you know? And, but that's no, no one out grappled them, right? I mean, nobody did. And, Maybe I'm wrong in this, but I, if we look at the best possible candidates, I'm definitely one of them. And then obviously I have a small size advantage too. So in a wrestling match, so we can just reduce that MMA match to a wrestling match. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the right strategy on him? Like, do, do you understand his style, that the, the, the his wrestling style, the pressure he applies? Do you understand yeah. how the hell he makes it happen? Yeah, I mean, see, he never, unfortunately fought any real who i would say really really high level wrestlers i was actually really disappointed how bad justin gaethje's wrestling was because justin gaethje had some solid success but his wrestling was really bad in that fight um gaethje had success in uh, cwa okay. yeah i think he was seventh place okay. maybe or so somewhere he was definitely all american uh it was lower though um so yeah, I would I would like to see how he dealt with someone who was like a who I think oh man this guy's a really high level wrestler because you know we saw and this is early in his career but you know Glace and Tebow did give him some issues earlier in his career, um, so I would like to see him in that situation and see how he does. I would love to like you know like I tell you, I just love wrestling and grappling like yeah I'd love it. if someone said hey uh, Ben, you know Khabib wants to roll with you <laughs> okay I'm there tomorrow it sounds like a blast let's go. He's probably competitive as hell. Yeah, right. you're still competitive. I know when to be and when not to be. Like, right. you know, say if I'm going to high school kids or I'm not going to be competitive because then I'm just being a dick. How would you, know? you take him down? What? What, what, what we're talking about? Real wrestling? Like wrestling, wrestling? Wrestling, uh, wrestling, wrestling. I would probably try to attack single legs and stuff. Single legs? Yeah. I haven't, okay. No, no. I mean, I have no, I've, honestly, I've, I don't have the slightest clue. I'd have to feel, I'd feel him out. Um, but single leg's my best take. Well, people That's talk about his wrestling being really good. Like yeah. People that train with him. So, uh, okay. So I, I grilled someone, I will not say who, on the Ed Ruth thing, because Ed Ruth yeah. is very elite at folk style wrestling. He never became that great at fighting, unfortunately. Wait, Ed Ruth wrestled Khabib? They were on the same team for a while, yeah. Okay. And there was rumors that Khabib beat him up and i said i i sure can't believe that uh, and i've heard that that was if they were just straight wrestling ed would get slightly the better of it well ed Ruth is like one of the greats he's great he's really good yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was what i heard they, but, it, but in an mma setting because of all the tools that khabib would get him i don't know uh, it, well, but I agree. I agree with Rogan on this one. That would have been good to see. Yeah, that would be fun. So yeah, if Khabib wants to work out, I'd, I'd love it. I love I love wrestling and grappling. I don't do much jiu-jitsu because I just don't have time for it anymore. I'm at the wrestling academy like every single day. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I love jiu-jitsu while I did it. And you know, if I didn't have wrestling academies, I probably would still be doing jiu-jitsu. Yeah, you did well in yeah. jiu-jitsu as well. But let me ask you a ridiculous question. Who's the greatest of all time, freestyle or folk style? Oh, wrestling. Wrestling. Hmm. 
Well, I, I will say my knowledge past like the year 2000 is really not that great. Cause you In can't which be, direction? Sorry, after uh, 2000? No, no, before. Because you can't find any film or anything, you know? And so you hear of all so these. So you need evidence? <laughs> you need direct evidence? I want to be able to watch them and see them and feel the times and feel their opponents and, you know, all those yeah. things to really like, I, I hate giving bad answers, you know? So um, I would, <laughs> I, there's just not enough footage of any of those people. You know, we took, we go back to someone like Alexander Medved. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't find footage. You can't find anything on him, you know? It's so, like, who is he wrestling? I, you know, I'm not sure. So, um, post 2000, I think, and, and obviously just freestyle. So, um, Americans, Russians. Uh, Satyev has the probably the best argument post 2000. I think Sad Julayev, um, if he yeah, the Russian tank, that Snyder. guy is, yeah. yeah. So, who's who's better, Snyder or Sad Julayev? So, Sad Julayev just won at the Olympics. No, I understand this, I don't understand how that works, but th it's pretty close, right? Not really, not not that match, but in yeah. general, the matchup. So, well, so Kyle won the first one in 17. Said July have pinned him the following year, but then Kyle lost and took bronze in nineteen, um, and then just lost. I don't want I don't want to say fairly decisively, but it was it was six to three, and the, the, there was a late takedown. He kind of gave it up, and maybe if it was really competitive, maybe he wouldn't have. Um, they're gonna wrestle again in like two weeks here, so that you know, yeah, you. I mean, you have to say said July at this point. There's nothing else to say unless Kyle proves us otherwise. Yeah. Not enough people talk about such a life. Okay, yep. well, you think that guy should go to MMA? You think Kyle should go to MMA? Some of these guys. Yeah, they're making enough money in wrestling where they don't really feel the need to. It's, it's, it's terrifying great. though, as a heavyweight, such a yeah. life would probably, it's like it's like Khabib, but heavyweight. Well, I don't know if you remember, do you remember Bilal Makov? Hmm. So Bilal Makov actually was the Russian representative in both styles in 2016, Greco and freestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, uh, to my knowledge, the only person the UFC has ever signed that was zero and zero in modern era, signed that was zero and zero. And then he actually never ended up fighting. <laughs> but weird, right? So yeah. yeah. No motivation. I, okay. I, don't, yeah, I, don't know, I don't know what the story is. Cause sometimes out of Russia, I mean, I don't, maybe you have better sources than I do. Sometimes it feels like dudes just disappear. Like they're a world champ or Olympic champ. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, I don't yeah. know, where'd he go? You, you talk shit about Russia earlier in the conversation. So oh, what I say? I, I forgot, but I think steroids. I think somebody's going to show up to your door. I'm worried. I honestly, I've said enough bad things where I would be, you know, kind of looking over my shoulder if I went to the <laughs> or something. Yes. Uh, I, for one, love the Russians. What but, about Icarus? How does that make you feel? What about it? It's fake news. Oh, really? I'm just kidding. It's right? propaganda. Maybe it is. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is anymore. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's troublesome, man. I, I hate cheating in yeah. all of its forms. Uh, any other like recaps from the Olympics of uh, 2020 Tokyo that stood out to you? Gable Stevenson, like anything Gable's like great. that? great, yeah. Um, no, I think America's coming to the point where we're gonna compete with Russia every single year in wrestling, which obviously, you know, I long, long time ago, many, many years, we did, we, you know, we were great. And then kind of after that Soviet Union period, I think there was a lot of poverty in that area and that kind of led the wrestling team going down a little bit. And then obviously a lot of those regions, uh, the way they found uh, oil and gas in the Caspian Sea, I believe, and they've been um, really kind of on the upswing for the last 20 years. And now uh, America really since 2012 has been on the upswing in wrestling and we're kind of really competing with them. And they're not sending a couple of their best guys to so Oslo. So for those who don't know, the Olympics got moved back a year. So they are hosting the 2021 World Championships, despite yeah. the fact that we just had the Olympics two months ago. So yeah. it's happening next week in Oslo, Norway. So like Russia is not sending their number one at 57 and their number one at 65. So it's like America's probably going to win, I think. I don't want to guarantee anything, but there's there's a really good it's chance. Dave Taylor, all those so guys competing. America gave any of the Olympians that medaled the opportunity to not even have to wrestle off. They just got to keep the spot since it was two months later if they medaled. So the only one who's not is Gable. Gable's moving on. We have a pretty good guy behind him named Nick Wisdowski, who's a world medalist. Uh, but then he's so Burrell's filled in the 79 spot. Jane Cox filled in the 92 spot, who's a world champion also. So we have a- uh, uh, It's pretty, a hell of a team. Pretty good squad, yeah. <laughs> pretty good squad. Pretty happy. Okay. So given your run in Bellator and one championship, that was like one of the most dominant runs in, in MMA. What would you say was like key to your dominance in that long undefeated streak? Huh. I, it probably cons consistency would be one. The fact that 
Uh, I just, I lived and trained the same way, no matter where my life was. Whereas a lot of fighters, once they start making money for the first time, they have all these obligations and they travel and they, they really enjoy making money. And that's kind of why some of them fall off. So you had like the same process, like the same yeah, I camp and- my house, I didn't vacation, every, yeah, everything. Just, no, you know, I, and well, so that, that was a big part of it. Um, obviously the, the style thing is like, no one could, there was only a few people who could stop my style um, and I think I continue to get better as a mixed martial artist and, um, I wasn't as innovative in mixed martial arts, but there was a handful of things that I innovated, you know, specifically in the top position where I spent a lot of time where it was just like, there was just, once I got on top of you, it was like in a spider web and there was just kind of no way out, you know, you never felt the certain things I was doing. And so people just. They, you know, they gave up eventually. How's the level of wrestling in MMA, would you say? So uh, I, I, I saw somewhere like champions, the, the most popular martial art for current UFC champions are all wrestling. So we just lost a bunch of the belts. Wrestling, wrestling as a sport, yes. right? But yeah, at one point we had, I think it was eight of nine yeah. maybe or, or something to that effect. Uh, and I, th I think it's not just wrestling, not just the actual martial art of wrestling that contributes to our success in mixed martial arts, but other things like the, the way we're systemized. So most kids who have success have went through the high school program and the college program, and they know how to show up on time and they know how to work hard. So when they go to ATT or AKA or wherever, they know how to show up on time and they know how to work hard. And that's going to get you a really long way. Just those two things, right? Not even the techniques, it's just Not the discipline. Those things. Then I think you throw on top of that the fact that most of us have competed 1,500 to 2,000 times, probably by the time we get to 20 something, like that's a huge advantage too. Most of these other people from other disciplines maybe have competed 100, if, if that, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this competitive process down really, 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 really well. Um, Plus the weight cut. The weight cut. There's all these things, right, that factor into it. Um, I think the fact that we're really open-minded, like I think if you would, I don't want to pick on jujitsu again, but like how many jujitsu guys have became highly proficient in wrestling versus how many wrestling guys have became highly proficient in jujitsu? I think that number swings one way and not that much the other way, you know? So we're open to adapting and learning. And, and for some reason, like jujitsu people, how many of them have got high level wrestling or even mediocre level wrestling? And the number's really small. Like they refuse to, it's really frustrating. Like, why won't they do this? this? Is obviously part of it, you know. If like, I don't pick on specific guys, but there's certain guys in the history of MMA where you're like, listen, man. I mean, D Damian Maya, who uh, who's my last fight, is a great example. Of someone who actually did get proficient wrestling, right? But there's some of these jiu jitsu guys. It's like, if you just got on top, you would submit him. Why can't you learn a freaking takedown? Mm -hmm. Like, holy moly! Like, just just learn how to take someone down. Once you get them down, they will not get up, and you win the fight. Like, it's so easy, you know. How, but they how, refuse. How complicated is that journey? So like uh, Donaher that you mentioned, yeah. uh, Craig Jones, they're big on wrestling as part of jiu-jitsu now. Yeah. Like wrestling, not just on the feet, but wrestling from the bottom coming yeah. up and all that kind of stuff. So how difficult is that whole skill set, would you say, for a jiu-jitsu person to learn? Um, not that hard. If they, if they really put their mind to it, because they already like, when you grapple, and this is any grappling art, like there's a certain part of it that you kind of get and it can, might not be the exact same thing, but you understand how your body moves and how to feel certain pressures and you can adapt yourself pretty quickly, you know? So I don't think, be, I think there's just a certain level of stubbornness where they didn't want to, certain people didn't want to do it for whatever reason. I think a lot of times in, in MMA, it's the I'm so macho, I can stand and bang thing, you know, where they want to, yeah. you know, show how macho they are. Um, but yeah, that, that was a frustrating one that, that they, it, there's a lot of wrestlers who became highly proficient in jujitsu and really adapted and it doesn't go the other way. And then I guess the other thing there too is um, they can both steal from each other, right? As, right. as any as any martial art can steal from another. And like, I feel like jiu-jitsu didn't do enough stealing from wrestling. Like they should have looked at all the wrestling possible and said, well, why, why don't we steal that and that and that, you know? And like, hey, let's take that over. And maybe we'd make a little tweak because it's different, but there's something we can definitely use there. So like in wrestling, for example, you know there's a one arm guillotine in jiu-jitsu, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a move called, well, it's got a hundred minutes, it's like the oldest move in wrestling because it's what they did, the cows where they go around the chin and they throw them on the back. <laughs> I don't know what you call that one. I don't know. Okay. Sorry, did you just ask me what I call that one? Yeah. 
Would you take a cow and grab it by the neck? <laughs> no, throw it to the side? no, but in wrestling, in wrestling. I don't know. No, no. Okay, we call. Are it you the, putting it under? Like, yeah, so like you, you grab their off? chin and then you go under their arm and then throw them under. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So we call that like the honey badger, but it's got honey badger. Different yeah. names wherever you go, it's got different names. Um, so I would always, I would say, like pre jujitsu, I was, I was average at it. Like I could do it, I, but against good people, you never get it for. Because oh, I'll tell you what, exactly. because they would get the back of their head up and they were too strong where you couldn't collapse them by going over their neck, right? Because yeah. the forces weren't right. So then in jiu-jitsu, you learn the one arm guillotine where you grab their chin and this is more of running along the side of their head and then and then you go here and mm -hmm. you choke them, right? Mm -hmm. Much more efficient way to move their head because the fulcrum is way down here and their head can move into mm -hmm. that, right? So once I learned that in jiu-jitsu, I'm like, wait, I can do this in wrestling. Mm -hmm. So now once I learn how to grab their chin the right way and I do the honey badger, no one ever gets out. Mm -hmm. I just had to steal that jujitsu, put it in wrestling, and boom, there we go. But very few people steal any direction. That takes creativity. Really? And open mindedness. It's so easy because it's already done. You just gotta steal it. I mean, same with judo. If if you're a gi jujitsu person, there's so much stuff in judo that um that's ripe for the stealing. Because mm -hmm. uh judo is much more emphasizes uh explosive uh, moves on the transition, which is something jujitsu does not do. Because you have- You some, mean from the takedown to- From the takedown, but also just in general, just in the transition, the, the concept of transition, the um, like jujitsu is very much about like, we're in this position, then we're in this position, then we're in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, the judo is much more in when, it, when there's chaos of any kind. Yeah. That's when you need to strike. Great and, time. And, to learn that, I mean, that's why people like Travis Stevens and Judoka, when they go to Jiu Jitsu, they can dominate. But Jiu Jitsu people should steal They're that. Too stubborn. Yeah, but so is every wrestlers are stubborn too. <laughs> no <I> way. <laughs> there would never be any stubborn wrestlers. Well, uh, I mean, I was surprised. Uh, it, you know, all these coaches, John Smith, uh, Dan Gable, they don't really have interest in MMA or Jiu Jitsu and so on. Don't really. Don't like, really. but you would think somebody like a John Smith would like. Put on a white belt and roll around. Yeah, I think he's just too focused on you know. Well, he's a coach. What right? he's a coach and what yeah. he's doing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I think if you if you take him when he's younger, he would have had a lot of fun. We actually have a really good wrestler making his MMA debut tomorrow. And if you Bo Nickel, I'm sure you've heard of him. Mm -hmm. Very high level. I think he's going to have a lot of success. I mean, some people might say that like jujitsu makes you a little comfortable being in your back, and for a wrestler that could be like really bad. I hate that take. Yeah, but that that's the Dan Gable take. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. For God's sakes, we know the fucking rules. Just yeah. wrestle, you don't go to your back. In jiu-jitsu, you can. It's like, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. but like, so jiu-jitsu, for example, um, so I coached, when I was at Rufus, I coached the wrestling for a long, I don't know, three, four, five years. Um, so I've been taking a jiu-jitsu guy and teaching them a wrestling technique where you needed to use your feet. Mm -hmm. To teach jiu-jitsu guys, so easy. So simple, because they already they already understand the concept, butterfly guard, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? To take a wrestler who's never done any of it and teach him how to use his feet, oh my God, it's such a beast. It's so hard, mm -hmm. you know, because they just that's not a weapon they're thinking about using. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we understand the rules. It's like freestyle and focus on wrestling. And freestyle mm -hmm. for the man, I can lock my hands. Mm -hmm. You don't see people locking their hands all the time in folk style just because they did freestyle. It's like, they, they get it. There's a rule, they understand it. So the notion that, Somehow you come from on your back. But pinning, that's like a, the, it has a special meaning. Yeah. I, mean, but I actually think, so jiu-jitsu, you, uh, you don't actually want to be right flat, flat very often, right? You don't want to be. I always wondered this because I did uh, a couple of ca catch wrestling tournaments. Uh -huh. And I did, I would put myself in butterfly mm -hmm. uh, guard. And it, I, w I wasn't going against good people. So, which yeah. is why I was doing all these things. But I, I wondered if you could, create a system of wrestling where you're butterfly guard. So I think it, there's uh, there's a few places where I use it. But so specifically the elevator series, which my main series up bottom, it is it's not butterfly guard. It's a butterfly guard like grip with your foot. So I boom, I go here, I catch with my your leg with my foot, boom, and I elevate you yeah. over, right? Um, and then also sometimes like, uh, I think Keegan does this too from watching me, but if I get double leg, sometimes, uh, if I'm accepting, uh, so freestyle, obviously you're going to give a point to me. Folks, accepting that you've already got me. And as I go down, I'm just going to 
butterfly guard you up, yeah, yeah. you know, and then I'm gonna try to flip my hip back to the mat and mm-hmm. get end up in a wizard position. Mm, nice. Like I've used that quite a few times where it's kind of like a bailout mechanism that gets me back to maybe not a great position, but obviously much better than being taken down. Beautiful. Yeah. Let me ask you quickly about crypto because you're also Love. you have a you have a show. <laughs> You uh, you have a lot of interest in cryptocurrency. Why are you interested in cryptocurrency? Is it just a financial investment, or yeah. is there a philosophy that attracts you to it? Philosophy. So I, my friend told me about it in 2017. I was actually I went to I was I was uh, my friend met me in Shanghai. I fought in one championship, um, and he told me. And the second he told me, I'm like, oh, I'm I'm so in because I had read Ron Paul and the Fed. I had read, I you know, kind of had an understanding how the Fed is unfair, um, and so when he told me about crypto, this you know, decentralized system that no one has control over, it just made sense. And so, like we've had you have the podcast with Tim Michael Saylor on, and I love the way he said this: like, who do you trust more with your money? Do you trust the politicians or do you trust engineers? I think that's an easy choice. Mm-hmm. I don't even think I don't even think I have to think about that. I don't trust politicians, no matter what country they come from—China, America, wherever—I don't trust them. Mm-hmm. So. so what about uh, in, two, uh, in uh, 2017, what was it, Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. Are you, um, what, do you, what do you find, which ones do you find interesting? Yeah. There's all kinds of ideas. So there's the, the, the more sort of primal mechanism of proof of work and Bitcoin, and then there's smart contracts, ideas, and uh, there's all kinds of innovations across the different... Yeah. Uh, so I can't say I'm in, I'm in super deep where I understand the technical components of a lot of them. I, under, I understand what Bitcoin can do for people. And so that's probably the one I've, I focus the most mm-hmm. on. Um, and I, I actually, I, was, I, was, I think I was talking about, I was trying to convince Michael to talk about Bitcoin because he hates it also mm-hmm. when he did it last night. And I think most of the main problems Bitcoin solves, people in America are so American centric, they don't understand it. So mm-hmm. like high levels of inflation, that hasn't happened in, what's, started to happen it hasn't happened in america in a long time Mm -hmm. right but someone in venezuela is like oh i get that you know or remittance payments right remittance Mm -hmm. payments to you see it so i saw this in um when i was spending all time in singapore singapore is obviously a really wealthy country and so you'd have indonesian workers or or Filipino, and they would all go on sundays they would go to these places to ship stuff back to their families and through western union western union gouges the shit out of these people i mean they're taking eight, 10, 12% of whatever they're sending, then it takes five days and the person's gonna pick it up. Whereas Bitcoin, I could send you Bitcoin person to person, right? So like American people don't understand that. American people don't really understand the unbanked, right? A a decent portion of the world is unbanked. They don't have access to it. And a much, much, much smaller portion of the world doesn't have access to internet. So if I can put a mobile wallet on your phone and we can send money person to person. So there's a whole bunch of those problems where Americans don't really think about mm-hmm. that are really obvious that this solves. Um, so I, I think that's the key one. Obviously, the fact that I'm, the value goes up is really outstanding also. But I, <laughs> but if you look at it, yeah, I got in in 2017, so I got to watch it go up. I didn't sell shit at the top, really stupid. And then the majority of my time was spent through the bear market. Mm-hmm. And so I had to love it for the principles that it provided, not the fact that actually I actually lost money in the beginning and now, now I'm way up. But um, yeah, so I- And you're just uh, holding. You're just, just holding. I think at the top of this bull market, I'll probably sell a, a very small portion. Um, just oh, you the, mean like right now there's a bull market? Yeah, yeah most, most people think say in the next three to six months will be at the top of the market. Okay. And so probably when that happens, uh, I'll probably sell a little bit. You got to huddle it, Ben. You got to huddle. Well, yeah. So I, well, I don't, here's what I, I, so my pod, one of my podcast co-hosts, he's, he's like super rich, like uber rich. So he has lost touch with the everyman. Yeah. So here's my argument to him. It's really simple. Um, And listen, I'm doing well for myself in life, but if say someone buys a Bitcoin, right? One Bitcoin at $5,000, which it was last year. And this Bitcoin goes from $5,000 to $200,000, which is, you know, right around what a lot of people think the peak is going to be. Mm-hmm. They bought one Bitcoin and they are living in a $200,000 house. So to take half of that, right? You started with $5,000 of the Bitcoin to sell half a Bitcoin for $100,000 and pay off your house, your remaining house payment, mm-hmm. that's life-changing to someone. Yeah. It really is. And so you still have half a Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin goes to a million, you're still going to have half a million and you're going to feel really, really rich with that half a million dollars because you bought it for, for effing $2,500, you know? Yeah. So yeah, so I would encourage anyone who's not uber rich 
to if you have huge profits, take a little bit of them because mm -hmm. it could change your life. And if you hold it and it goes down, you're going to feel the pain of that. Like yeah. so, it, sometimes if you're more constrained financially, it's much more psychologically difficult to ride the, the ups and downs. Yeah, it is for sure. This, so they have these really fascinating things in Bitcoin. I, we just had the guy, on, uh, one of the main guys on our podcast, it's called on-chain metrics. Mm -hmm. So all all wallet transactions are visible, you know? And so they have these all these fun categories. I love, so I actually, I think you said you don't like numbers, but. I like numbers. Oh, I you like love numbers. numbers. I love so numbers. I love numbers also. So they have all these different categories. Like um, you can see how long a, a wallet has held uh, a Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Or how many Bitcoins are in a certain wallet. And so what they've seen during this the downturn, right? So April, it kind of peaked and went down is that the the whales are still buying. So whales, people of a thousand or more are, are still buying. Mm -hmm. They've said the main group of sellers is the ones who held it from zero to three months. Mm -hmm. So like they don't have money. They bought it because they thought it was going up. And I was like, oh shit, I got to sell it. Right, whereas anyone who's had it for a long time is generally still holding on to it. That's interesting. That's a good indicator, right, yeah. for the whole space. Yeah. Well, let me ask you for some advice. You've been through <laughs> one heck of a career, one heck of a life. What advice would you give to a young person today? Well, in wrestling, I I, I think wrestling is really a microcosm of what your life's going to be, and that's why one of the things that I stress to kids is like. If we can go through this now and you figure, I have, I, I have a couple of kids who are struggling with certain things right now. If you can figure out this now in wrestling, it's gonna be a lot better to figure out now and get over this mental hump than when you're 32 and you have two kids and right and your job's not going well. It's gonna be a lot worse. It's gonna be a lot more painful then. Let's let's fucking figure it out now. So a lot of these things, a lot of these lessons we can learn from wrestling, whether it's persistence or perseverance or, or work ethic or you know, like I said wrestlers show up on time and they work hard, right? These things, if we can learn these things at an early age, those are generally those characteristics characteristics will generally carry on throughout our life. And those are the things that are gonna make us really successful. So um I, you know, I would say find a great coach, someone who's gonna spend a lot of time and put a lot of time into you and make sure they have a lot of wisdom and steal all the wisdom that you can from them. And then though if you can be successful at one thing, generally whatever that recipe was that took you to be successful at that, apply it to everything else, right? Apply it to the rest of your life, apply it to uh, getting a wife that you enjoy, uh, apply it to uh, living in a place you want to live, doing a job you want to do, right? There, there's so many possibilities and, and you just have to be bold enough to go take those chances. It's interesting because like early on in life is when you have much more time. Like people yes. don't realize this, time to learn the lessons. Like s somehow later in life, you get busier, responsibilities and all that kind of stuff. Like high school is a magical time, even yes, college. In college, yeah. Sure. Yeah, there's so much time to <laughs> right? learn. Well, you like, didn't even have kids yet. It's yeah, late. I don't have kids, but it <laughs> still fills up. Well, no, I, I'm purpose. And I did something that many people don't seem to be able to do. I walked away from a lot of responsibilities just How? by saying goodbye. Oh, okay. By like, but you know, meetings, like there's everybody around me at MIT mm -hmm. was like, meetings fill the day. And then yeah. you have more projects and, and you do, a great job and you become successful and then the more meetings fill the day and more yeah. responsibilities as opposed to like, wait a minute, do I wanna be involved in all these things? Uh, and instead, do I wanna find one or two things to really focus on? And th that's what I choose. But like yeah. that it becomes harder and harder and harder as you get older. No, well, I mean, I'm sure, and and also the more success you have, you become sought after other places yeah. too. I'm, I'm sure that's happening with you. And it's hard to say, yes. keep saying no, no, no. It is, saying no is hard. Yeah. yeah. You're known for roasting people with a, sing <laughs> uh, with a single boom roasted line. So uh, any ideas, maybe you want to mention malice, but any ideas come to uh, mind when you look at me? Man, I, you know what? Uh, if I was gonna boom roast someone, I would want to kind of like research their career and dissect them and figure out their biggest negatives. Get to the core. <laughs> and I did. I didn't have that notion with you. I figured. I, you yeah. know, I got a general sense of okay, he's really successful. He's super sharp. Uh, he's really interested in some really interesting mm -hmm. things. I bet we'll have a great conversation. But I had no intention to roast you. Yeah. There you go. What about Malice? You had dinner with him last night. Hmm. For him. <laughs> oh man. Um, How'd you get to know him? By the way. How, Twitter. How'd you, just Twitter. Twitter's the most magical place in the world, right? <laughs> I, I always tell people it's the greatest source of information if you know how to use it. Um, hmm. He's yeah. insane on Twitter, actually. He's he, quite he, a So I had to unfollow him on Twitter because he- It was too intense? It's too much. No, it's too much. It fills up. Like, 
I want to be able to consume the content. So if yeah. I want to see something he says, I can go to his page, right? Yeah. But it's just too much for my timeline. I want to be able to consume who I follow. So I try to not follow a lot of people because I want to be able to consume them. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was he was yeah, he was too much. He you know, he fights the trolls, which uh, I don't know why you would ever fight the trolls. There's just too many of them. Even well, he's a troll himself. He's like the big troll fighting the little trolls. He's <laughs> but the he, king troll. Yeah, there's a million of them. So even if you kill if you kill a hundred thousand, there's still nine hundred thousand left. Yeah, they just keep calling. Them. You just gotta ignore them. It's the like the night walker or whatever. Yeah. Well, I'll take it because you had nothing. Um, you you couldn't roast GSP out of respect too. Yes. So I'm just gonna take that as a sign of respect. What do you say bad about GSP? I, I now I try to roast his hair. Like, why is he trying to grow grow hair now after all these years? Yeah. He looked good bald. Everyone loved him with his head shaved. Yeah. Now it looks kind of strange. Like, why you got hair now? Well, it was uh, one of the more surreal moments of my life. Is so he was here and he wore a black suit and tie. Uh, oh really yeah we did the podcast with him just mirror image of me uh -huh. and then we also did uh i haven't released it yet but just a video together and us doing a uh, martial arts stuff in in a suit and tie that was that's quite funny. that was quite uh that that's like like certain moments in your life are just like i can't believe i was part of that yeah and, from uh with gsp uh so yeah i don't i don't think i have anything to roast him about um I mean, maybe the Matt Sarah thing would be the one that you could get him <laughs> with, you know. But uh, yeah, I would be I would be really fascinated to like really dig deep uh, from a sports psychology standpoint because he always talks about how much fear he had when he was competing, yeah. and I and I find that to be interesting because obviously, so it, it's almost like to me it's almost like was he successful despite that, not because of that, right? And because anxiety usually leads to really negative performance for the majority of people, and what was it about? him that the anxiety wasn't super negative you know what i'm saying like yeah. it's it's very interesting i wonder that too so i have i wonder that about him but i, I have a huge amount of anxiety interacting really? especially with people just about everything yeah mm. i wonder if that's helpful or, or or not it feels like it's very helpful well i, I think so i so okay i think in two different things. so i think uh probably your everyday life okay is different than like in a performance or a competition. It's, you have to be like super in the moment mm -hmm. of what you're doing. So anything that's pulling you away, like, oh my gosh, you know, for high school kids, right? That coach, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, my, that girl's in the stands. And if I get beat then, and they're actually, they're actively thinking about this other thing mm -hmm. when this is going on. And yeah. I need all hundred percent of your focus well, well, right he, here. He's never, I don't think he has anxiety in the ring. That's the point. I think like, I have the same thing. Like if I have a really high, performance thing mm -hmm. that I have to do uh i don't know a lecture in front of a lot of people yeah that, that'd be a great example that there's huge amount of anxiety weeks ahead days ahead hours ahead so, so you have a system to get rid of it then as no, you perform I, maybe but it's just the body gets rid of it somehow yeah I, there's not a system subconscious system so, yeah it's so you don't you don't actually have anxiety while you're pre no, performing so no. that's like so then, then, then that problem somehow that problem has solved itself, right? The problem is when the anxiety is actually happening while yeah. the wrestling match is happening. That's the real issue. Yeah, but it, it's a, it like sneaks in there too. Is that's the difference between MMA and wrestling? Is there's no breaks in wrestling, right? Yes. I guess there is. Small you can look at the crowd a little bit. Like yeah. you can look. So maybe a lot of bounds, maybe. But like the there's other things we have to perform. Well, well, there's more breaks, like a lecture. You can catch yourself thinking, like in this conversation, you know. Yeah. Like I'll, I've said a bunch of stuff where I think, "Why the hell did you say that? That's <laughs> dumb, right?" That, that's the anxiety because there's a pause, mm -hmm. and that, that, that could be. Um, I don't know. I, I think it just pushes me to be better, but maybe I could be way better if I let go of that. Yeah. It's scary to think that GSP, if you let go of that, that's but he, see, could he, he, he could have been better, yeah. or did he have a, did, did he have a, like you're saying, like. You don't necessarily feel those. So I think certain people that I've coached, like they would describe how they would feel literally during the wrestling match, mm -hmm. right? And you're saying like during the the speech the performance, it's mostly gone. Yep. And that's so that's it would be interesting to see if like you know, he talked a lot about that. But if it was all if it was all the way somehow gone, and he and that means he would have a mechanism for it. So like I had a really bad performance my freshman year of high school at nationals because I had. I had the ability to be anxious. And one of my coaches talked about like, and a lot of A-type personalities are kind of that way, you know, because they're trying to consider all possibilities at the same time. And 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 while we're actually performing or competing, it's negative to performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he said, 
he would always leading up to the match within say an hour he would his name was talking about fishing he would get someone to talk about fishing with him because it would mm -hmm. stop him thinking about the match and and being uber anxious so i always i kind of really took that to heart and it really helped me as i would always like have someone to talk to and just, just goof around about whatever mm -hmm. so i'm not thinking about this thing and then once i step in it's time to go so i didn't have this like anxious build up now it's how for me i took it away but like me you know like you said you have a way to get it away obviously because it's yeah there i guess so i guess there's little little tricks you come yeah, up with yeah you start thinking tricks. about it's not fishing maybe i should try the fishing thing but i hate <laughs> fishing so boring <laughs> well maybe maybe it's good <laughs> to think about that all right ben this is uh like i told you i'm a big fan i'm a big fan of your wrestling your fighting your personality uh thank you for coming down thank you for talking today appreciate it it's a huge honor bam let's Please. go wrestle thanks for listening to this conversation with ben Askren. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Muhammad Ali. Only a man who knows what it is like to be defeated can reach down to the bottom of his soul and come up with the extra ounce of power it takes to win when the match is even. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.